Good morning. Welcome to the Board of Liquor License Commissioners for Baltimore City's morning docket. Today is Thursday, June 14th, 2018. Uh, the morning docket includes regular items, new transfers, expansions, and hardship applications. If you have a cell phone or other electronic device, I would ask that you silence it now or put it on vibrate. When your case is called, please step up to the microphones. Uh, state your name clearly into the microphones uh, because we have a court reporter uh, taking down notes and information. And if you're going to be giving testimony, please be prepared to be sworn in. Madam Chair, may I begin? Yes. Calling the first case, Donald Higdon, Anthony Scardina, Jr., and Anthony Scardina III, Higgies, LLC, trading as Higgies, 1184 Cleveland Street. There's a class BD7 beer, wine, and liquor license and application to transfer ownership. Good morning, Mr. Good morning, um, acting chairman, members of the board, Peter Previs on behalf of the applicants. Mm. Um, before we begin, I want to present the board with a good standing. Apparently, the accountant didn't get the um, form one in time to the but I just wanted to let you know that we had taken care of that promptly. Thank you. We're here on a, an application to transfer ownership of Higgies, which is a BD7 beer, wine, and liquor license. Yes, we, we were previously here. Uh, this is a transfer of ownership only and not location. Uh, the, the issue that arose previously and the reason that this matter was postponed was the um, allegation that the establishment had remained closed for longer than 180 days. Um, I spoke with the transfer or Mr. Schaefer. Uh, he indicates that when he moved out of this property that he, um, he um, didn't keep any records. Um, and he was also furious with me because when the deed was recorded of this property, the water department didn't get that memo and sent him, keep sending him water bills, which I immediately went down and did a change of address for that. But uh, he, he indicated to me that he had no information and did not intend to come. I therefore would call Miss Joanne Martin, the, the local um, license inspector, liquor license inspector with regard to the opening of the premises. Before we uh, continue, I'd like to have the witnesses oh, I'm sorry. sworn in. Raise your right hands, please. And do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. And when you testify, if you could please speak into the mic and state your name for the record. All right. Uh, again, I'd first call Ms. Joanne Martin. Ms. Martin? Were you sworn in? Yes, yes sir. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne Martin, Baltimore City Liquor Board. Okay, Ms. Martin, are you are a, a Baltimore City Liquor Inspector? Yes, I am. And how long have you been an inspector? 22 years. Okay, and what is your current area for inspections? Um, it would actually be the 46th District, okay. which is... I'm sorry. Okay. And, and uh, is 1184 Cleveland Street, formerly known as Schaefer's and proposed to be named Higgies, part of your jurisdiction? Yes, they are. Okay, <clears throat> and, and uh, do you recall inspecting this premises on previous occasions? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, and um, this application was filed on March 29, 2017. Uh, do, do you recall inspecting the premises prior there too? Uh, yes, in 2016. Okay, D did you bring records with you that, that you can refresh your memory with regard to yes, when I you did. inspected the premises? Yes, I did, my actual inspections. Okay. D uh, and. Did you inspect the premises on August 16, 2016? Yes, I did. And was the premises open and operating? Yes, it was. And was the bar fully stocked? <clears throat> yes, it was. And there was somebody behind the bar? Yes. Okay, and did you next inspect the premises on November 15, 2016? Let me make sure. Yes, 
sorry. It's okay. Uh, November 15th. <clears throat> of 2016? Yes. Okay, and was the premises open and operating? Yes, it was. And did you take a photograph of the trader's license? Yes, I did. And did you also take a photograph of the bar? Yes, I did. Okay, and it was fully stocked and open and operating? Yes. And the television was on, I see. Same picture, yep. Okay. Yeah. And did you next inspect the premises on January 24th, 2017? Yes, I did. Okay, and was the premises open and operating on that date? Uh, yes, it was. And the bar was fully stocked? Yes. And somebody was behind the bar? Yes. Okay. Now, do you recall having occasion to speak with Mr. Um, Joseph Don Schaefer, the, the prior licensee? Uh, I had had numerous conversations with, with him. Okay. And uh, back in, in 2015, did he did he have a contract to sell the premises to another buyer, not these these folks? I do believe so. I don't. It has been three years, but yes. Okay. And I think that fell through. And and. And, and as a result of that um, deal falling through, did you have occasion to speak with Mr. Schaefer with regard to the requirements of, of the premises remaining open every so often? Yes, I did. Okay. I had the conversation with him in reference to uh, being open every 90 days, yes. Okay. And, and, and he, he understood that and he complied with that? Yes. Okay, and he was also routinely open for Ravens home games, is that right? That's my understanding. Okay, and that was during the 2016-17 the season? Football season. Okay, um, and th this being in your jurisdiction, you also don't live too far away from this premises, is that right? That's correct. And you routinely drove past there on occasion as it was one of the places on your beat? Yes. Okay. Um, Thank you. I have no further questions. Any questions no. for Ms. Martin? So, uh, I, uh, Ms. Uh, Martin, uh, so the last I heard from, from your testimony, January 24th, 2017 is the last time you inspected the premises. That's correct. Okay. And then I also see in our docket that <clears throat> you, I believe it's, let me make, confirm that it is you, I think it is. On June 27th, 17, you indicate, or the inspector's report indicates that the establishment was closed in March of 17. That's correct. All right, I just want to make um, sure I'm following. <coughs> mm -hmm. If I can ask a follow-up question, it might assist your Please. understanding. That's fine. Yeah, he had uh, so the, the transfer application was filed in March 29, 17. And you were required to do a, 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 a posting and a transfer inspection? That's correct. Okay, and you, sp and you spoke with Mr. Higdon, one of the proposed licensees, about when they'd actually purchased the real estate? That's correct. And that was effective Mar at the end of March of 17. Yes, that, right? that was on June 26, and I actually posted a sign. Okay, so the, the, where, where the information for the came transfer. from for the March was, was Mr. Higdon advising you that they had purchased the real estate? Uh, That's correct. Mr. Higgin had told me that he uh, entered into a contract in March of 2017. Right. Okay. Thank you. No okay. Further questions. Any further questions? No. Hold on. I, I will have you testify. Oh, you have a question? Yes. Actually, let, let's let him finish and then you can ask questions. Read your name out. Of Ms. Martin. Sherry Seibel, S-C-I-B-L-E, and I'm a resident right up the street from the establishment. Okay. Um, we, we had previously put on testimony with regard to the, the transfer it's itself. Would, would you like me to recap that before we get to Ms. Seibel? Yes, please. I'd like the timeline. Thank you. I call him um, Mr. Donald Higdon. Mr. Higdon, you were sworn? Yes, I am. Okay, and you were one of the proposed uh, applicants for this license? Correct. Okay, and including the real estate, what was the total purchase price for 1184 Cleveland Street? Do you recall? 125000 Okay, and, and part of that was for purchase of the real estate, and the other part was purchase of the liquor license and the, and the bar premises, is that right? That is correct. Okay, and you actually settled on the real estate already? Yes. And that was done when? In June, I believe it was. Beginning of June of uh, 2017. Okay. And um, 
Um, there are three licensees here, yourself, Mr. Scardina Jr. and Mr. Scardina III. Correct. Okay, and, uh, and, Mr. and each one of you plans to be at the premises at all times that it would be open? Yes, sir. And how do you plan to run this operation as what? As a bar serving light fair. Neighborhood type of yeah, establishment? Yeah, ex exactly. And exactly. You, you, you plan on catering to the, to the neighbors? Well, my, our vision of the product that we want to present is one, a neighborhood bar where people can come in, feel comfortable, sit down, um, relax, not have to look over their shoulder. I was a police officer for 25 years, and anything below that, I think, would be a, you know disrespectful to myself as well as the community. <coughs> so we want to hold a higher standard, not only to ourselves, but to our customers. And that's kind of, I also explained that to Ms. Scheibel. Okay, and, and you, you plan on being open seven days a week? Correct. And for, for, from what hours? I've, we, to be honest with you, we really hadn't looked into it that far because we've kind of met so many roadblocks. We really haven't mapped okay. out that future yet. But you, you would plan on being open during the mornings or would it just be? That would be in the afternoon. Afternoons evening, yes. until close or until business dictated? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, how many employees would you hire? Well, between the three of us, probably an additional three. Okay. And um, the, the place is basically ready to open? It's fully stocked and ready to go. Okay. Uh, thank you. I have no further questions unless the board has some questions of Mr. Higbee. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Any further testimony? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. Ms. Seibel, you're here on behalf of? Myself. Right. The community, my residents around me that um, had viewpoints about it, but they didn't have the time or didn't think that they would be heard. Um, my question is about the um, letter that's in the file saying that on June 15, 2016, it's been um, out of operation, not operated for a total of 412 days. And I'd like to know, you know, what this letter meant and it's saying that he had not requested a hardship extension and they're only 180 days so I'm just trying to make sense of what I found in the file. And which letter are you referring to? When you started the transfer you started a new file and I came to the liquor board and looked at the old file and I brought this up both times that I was at the previous hearings. And I thought that's what this hearing was about, that they were supposed to um, provide proof of having bought liquor wholesale, that stock the bar, proof of having been open, sales tax, and instead they bring the inspector with reports. So I'm just kind of surprised of how the proof changed from being proof of being open to this proof of inspections mm -hmm. and to prove that it was open. Uh, do we have, I don't see that this letter is in our file. No, okay. I brought that up at two different hearings too. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, and, and there's no dates on stuff that there's, are in the file. I don't see any dates of, on this letter. And even the letter from the previous owner that was received wasn't even stamped for the date received. I, if I could. Hold on uh, one second. For the record, uh, when did you, when do you think this letter was written? There's no date on it. Well, it, it says down here at the very bottom of it, it should say June. Uh, I see. And would you like to submit this as evidence or test evidence it's today? <laughs> it's in your file, and I thought that you were going to refer to the old file and bring the information forward. Two times I thought you were going to do that. So I'm just, to me, this is, at this point, is accountability from the liquor board as much as it is as a business trying to open. And so your testimony is that it was not open. It 
was not open. And, and the testimony is that it was not open, uh, what is it, 412 days? 12 days and beyond that, all the way until the January 2017 inspection. And other than this letter or these documents, do you have any other evidence that you would like to present before the board? No, just that I live nearby and I talked to other residents and they said that on some game days that the owner would be there, but he brought his friends and the doors were locked. So it wasn't technically open. That's what, I know that's hearsay here, but. Did you hear the testimony of Inspector Martin and when she said that the, she made at least three inspections of the premises and it was open? I heard her say that. Ms. Feibel, you had, did you have any further questions for, any questions for Ms. Martin? No, I'm just refer back to what was in the file and, mm -hmm. and that's before her, she said she inspected her first inspection picked up in August of 2016. Mm -hmm. At June of 2016, it was closed for 412 days, according to your file. So, uh, go ahead. It doesn't even go say ahead. who's writing that is from the liquor board. That's so, so let me, uh, that's a letter, it appears it's not from the liquor board, but it's to the liquor board from Mr. Schaefer, from what I, go ahead, Ms. Yeah, that's from the, li that's a liquor board. It appears to be a liquor board note in the file. Well, it, it appears, oh, go ahead. I, I, it seems it it seems to be as uh, Commissioner Greenfield stated that uh, it was a letter given to us. But there's another letter in there that is from Mr. Schaefer asking for the hardship extension. So that's mm -hmm. his writing. Well, that, so, so Ms. Sub, I think okay. we agree. I think it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I I would ask just for clarity's sake, Mr. Previs or Mr. Acris, and I know we have Madam Chair, someone. Uh, I guess from the community who also wants to testify on this. Yes. But can, can we walk through that? Because Ms. Seibel has raised this issue before uh, the commission on a couple occasions. So it appears to me that Ms. Martin has addressed the issue from March or so of 17 and the file, let me just finish Ms. Seibel. The, uh, assuming that's true, the transfer would have told that as I understand it and so it could be a live license. But I guess I'm trying to understand the, the gap between the, four, the 412 days that's in the letter, the 6-15-2016 to the March 2017. I'm trying to understand, again, I think we've had this case before us twice and we've said to you, Mr. Priebus, we need more information to demonstrate that it's, and you brought some, inf you obviously uh, questioned Ms. Martin with respect to it being live, but you didn't address going back to the June 16 date, which I think Ms. Seibel has raised a couple times. Right. Okay, My, I didn't represent, and I don't represent the um, um, Joseph Donald Schaefer and Schaefer's Inc., but I did review the liquor board file and I did familiarize myself with, there's two, two documents in there. One is a handwritten hardship letter from Mr. Schaefer and it's undated but it appears to speak of the fact that he had this prior transaction that had fallen through back in 2015. Then there's a letter from somebody, and I'm not sure who, but it appears to say, if, if you calculate this under a worst case scenario, it could be up to 400 some days. It's not documenting that he was closed from a particular day to another day. I believe there was something else in the liquor board file that's, that the, an inspector went by and one of the neighbors said, he's been open for Ravens games. So that, the fact that he was open during Ravens season would have dispelled that 400 and some day calculation under any circumstance. Sure, it, it would, except I, I don't see testimony, I don't see evidence of that. That's, that's the dilemma is something that suggests that during that June 16 to March 17 period, if I'm following, that there's evidence that it was open and operating. That that to me is the issue. If I'm okay, talking. we that's what I'm gonna read. okay we have we have August 16, 16, we have November 15, 16, we have January 24, 17. Oh, I see what you're. And then we have the transfer filed March 29, 17, which cuts it off. Sorry, I'm a little so, I'm slower today than normally. So your point is that Miss Martin's testimony addresses those that yes. gap in the six the. June 16 to the March 17, right. and her testimony suggests, Ms. Seibel, that it was open and operating. So I guess I would 
then pivot back to you. I'm sorry, Ms. Madam Chair, if I'm talking too much here. That's if you have questions of Ms. Martin about that, I think that might be appropriate uh, uh, about those those periods that that Mr. Previs is referring to. So, so when did you pick up? I'm, I'm up to June 15th of 2016. And I think Mr. Previs is suggesting that that Ms. Martin's testimony addresses the fact that it was open and operating after June of 16. After, but I'm asking about before the 412 days. I, I don't know how far the board goes back into 2015 when the license was renewed. Okay. And I'm at a loss not, not, not being my former client, not being my present client with regard to premise periods back that far, but the liquor board obviously investigated, they sent inspectors out and they deemed it appropriate not to hold a hearing and to reissue the license, so. So, but you're, you're not here to dispute that Miss um, Martin's testimony that on in an inspection in August, November, and then in January that it was open and operating? From all appearances, the bar was closed. Okay. That's what I have to say. But your point is that before June of 16th, mm -hmm. there's, the, according to that letter and based upon your personal observations, it was not open and operating for a significant period of time. Right. And Mr. Previs, we can't get, uh, according to the current licensee, Mr. Schaefer, we don't have, he says he doesn't, didn't keep any of his records and we couldn't get any evidence whatsoever to substantiate that it was open and operating before June of 16 within the period that's required by law? I don't have it because he indicated when he sold the, 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 the real estate and he moved out, he threw everything. everything out. Didn't think it was necessary at that point. Not that he was being obstructive or flippant or anything, but he just, it didn't cross his mind. How about the sales tax information that you asked for last time? Yeah. And that information you can get, right? Ma'am, did you have something to add? First, you have to be sworn in and state your name for the record, but be sworn in first. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Your name? Alicia Williams. And and are you here on behalf of the community? I am, yes. I am a resident of Craven Street, and my one testimony is that I purchased my house in July of 2015 on the 1100 block of Cleveland Street, and I have yet to see any operation of Schaefer's since that time. Ms. Martin, you, you don't have any records whatsoever before June of 16? Uh, I, I don't. I'd have to look in the file. At that time, I was in a, a different district, so I wasn't in that district at that time in the year 2015-16. However, um, our SharePoint at the time did not, would only take one picture, so I'm not sure what, if you have the actual pictures that I took that day. I mean, I can't, I have a trader's license. I, I Which day is that? I have 2016. I have a invoice. I have a picture of the bar that's stocked <laughs> and operating. I mean, when I, I don't know if those pictures showed up in the SharePoint. Well, the issue is uh, predating June of 2016. So when are those pictures taken? These were taken in um, August of 16. And then, of course, I did pull this. The um, This is the Maryland um, to show that he did file property tax for those years. Affidavits being filed to, pro to protest the renewing of this license at any time during your inspection period? 
Uh, no, I'm not aware of any. Not aware of any um, uh, complaints or uh, <clears throat> for the renewal. Right, thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you made your inspection, were there any uh, patrons inside of the tavern? Um, God, this has been two years. Um, I'm going to say in August there were, yes, in August there was a person in there. A person? Yes. Any further questions? Um, when you made your, the last one, the inspection you made in January of, um, of 2017, was that at a request of an appointment or was there a reason you made the inspection? What are you asking me again? Was that by appointment yes. or by? Yes, January of 2017. Was that by an appointment? I really, I really can't recall. I really can't. Say, I mean, that's been a while. I really can't say truthfully if I made an appointment or I went by and stopped because someone was there. Um. Wouldn't you normally record that kind of information? Wouldn't it be in the file? What information are you talking about? About <laughs> the reason you went there. What, well, what that's what I do. Went? I visit bars. I do. I, I make inspections. I don't make appointments with people to show up. We just show up. I don't. I have a route that I go by, and if I haven't been there in 90 days, I try to get back there and see what's going on. That's my job. Okay. I don't make appointments. Okay. Thank you. Well, Ms. Martin. Um, if the business is open and there isn't anyone there and the bar is fully stocked, everything is in place, can you note that, ins would you note on that inspection that the bar was open for business, whether anyone was in there or not, would you note in your, ins in your records that the bar was open for business? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I'm good. Agent Fossler, did you want to testify? Or do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. <clears throat> Chief Inspector Mark Fossler, uh, just wanted to comment that generally speaking, when we go in, the uh, appointments aren't made, uh, inspectors go out and to their district that they're uh, very familiar with. They generally are checking information that's required in the inspection, the uh, trader's license, et cetera, and that uh, the uh, open and operating would not include indicating that patrons were there. It would say open and operating. That it, there's no requirement by law that says that patrons have to be in there. And uh, Inspector Martin has been a reliable, uh, credible inspector and agent for more than 22 years. So, so, Mr. Foster, I guess my frustration here is this is the third time we've heard this transfer, and I think there's some legitimate issues that we just, again, don't have information on. Um, because to determine that this license is not valid is a problem for, I think, the applicants who in good faith purchase this license. And so, and Ms. Seibel, and, and I believe it was Ms. Williams, if I got that right, um, raised some interesting and legitimate points. I guess my frustration is why don't we have, before the June 16, why don't we have inspection reports to determine whether it was open and operating. That, that's what I, I think we need. Assuming Mr. Schaefer, who I think is not doing us much service here, um, hasn't provided any evidence to support this transfer. Uh, Commissioner and members of the board, uh, I was appointed to chief inspector position in April 
of 2016. So I, I can't speak to what had occurred prior to that. Uh, and certainly Mr. Schaefer has been reluctant to be cooperative. And, you, and the applicants haven't closed on the liquor license yet. Is that well? The, the, is that part of the same transaction? It's it's all part of the same transaction. They they did a contract without an attorney, and they they paid the money and they purchased the the building. They obviously understand that the, it's up to the board to approve the transfer of the license. That's not for them to to assume that that's going to happen. But. Um, um, it, it, it happens on occasion that um, people might talk to an attorney when they purchase real estate, but they don't talk to an attorney that's familiar with the liquor licensing until after the fact and then realize there were other issues. So it's a contract without conditions, but and they didn't do it to, to, to thumb their nose at the liquor board. They just didn't understand. So we're here. We're, we're, we're here in good faith. Um, the liquor board file uh, under Mr. Fossler's watch is, is, is fairly detailed. Prior to that, it's not as detailed, but there are indications that it was open during Raven season. So I, I think it is open, but um, it, the other issue is for the board is how, how far do you go back when the license has been renewed? Obviously, the, the period that we're dealing with, but um, at, at without any protests or indications that there was an issue prior there to, um, there was there's there's something in the board's file to investigate and it was investigated and the place you know, inspections after that 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 notation but um, we asked the board to, to consider that we've done everything we can in good faith and mr. Schaefer has indicated he's has no records and we are where, where we are right the, the the problem is that we have this letter that it wasn't <coughs> open and operating since May of 2015 to June of 2016. And, and it's hard to reconcile the two. We don't know who the letter is from and it, it appears to me to be a directive to somebody to, to check it out. It's not a finding that the place has been closed for 400 and some days. And again, there was there's there's, some, there's an inspector's report somewhere in the file that indicates that they went by and, and the neighbor said, no, they were open raven season, so that would certainly knock a hole in that 415-day uh, calculation. But it's not a finding that they were closed. It's, it's, it's a directive to somebody to check it out, and Chief Inspector Fossler had done a fine job of that at that point. The final point I'd like to make on this is that the, the, the testimony of the neighbors is not necessarily inconsistent with the liquor inspector or the indications in the file that the place is open. The, the, the standard for, for compliance with the 180 day rule or 90 day rule is that the place is open and, and available for operations, not necessarily that it is doing a seven day a week um, bang up business. So the inspector is counseling the licensee, these are your requirements and you need to do this and the licensee is complying with the minimum. It, 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 the, the, the neighbor might think that the place is not open when in fact they are in compliance with the law. Do you have anything further, Mr. Hoseman? Just in, in, in doing my due diligence, I actually went, canvassed the neighborhood, went door to door, and I was able to locate a gentleman who was a pretty adamant Raven fan, and he was available on the last hearing. Unfortunately, he's down Ocean City on his family vacation today, so he was unable to be here. But he's told me that 
I expressed my concerns that the bar wasn't open in Raven season. He said, no, it was open. I've been there. I would gladly come and testify before the board for that. And unfortunately, it, it conflicted with the vacation. Uh, there's also a side entrance to the bar, which means traffic could flow quite freely in and out of that bar and never be seen from actual Cleveland Street because it faces uh, West Austin Street. And other than that, like I said, we've done everything on our part to try to, to bring this to the table. I met with the community association and gave them a presentation as to what our plans were, what we envisioned, and how we envisioned helping the, the community. Uh, everyone was on board. They asked questions for over a half hour, and uh, there were no objections at that time. I had also met with a Mr. Parker who wrote us a raving letter of recommendation, but then I found out that he wasn't associated with what he was supposed to. So, you know, continuously we've kind of gone above and beyond to do things the right way. And what happened in 2015, uh, as, a, as a lay person, my understanding of how can a bar be open and operating under license, but then we're going to say, okay, under 2015, there was a time period where it wasn't open. You know, it's kind of like putting the horse before the cart, and that's the only questions I would have. But we've done everything we can. I've met with... Ms. Seibel and we spoke before this meeting and I think she agrees with what my vision of the bar would be. I think her, her concerns are they've been told things in the past that weren't lived up to. And I've kind of assured her that, you know, I can only give you my word. This is what I plan to do. This is how I want to work things and present ourselves to the community. And again, being a police officer, I'm not going to lower myself just to make a buck serving a beer over a bar and compromise the neighborhood, my reputation, or our reputations also. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? I mean, I, I'm sorry to do that. I, I would move to, again, postpone this because I just think um, for one last try at this because, um, you know, I, again, I don't know, Mr. Priebus, if Mr. Schaefer has, you know, Amex accounts that say that he bought. So I, I just something to substantiate that it was open and operating that period of time to me would be helpful and I I feel bad for Ms. Seibel to have to come each time I feel bad for for your clients who I do believe are are doing everything <coughs> in their power to do do the right thing here um, and I'm reluctant Madam Chair to just um, deny this because there is some conflicting evidence and I know again I apologize but and frankly we you know the board itself has some responsibility because our, our records aren't in the past before Ms. Mr. Fossler's um, uh, position, uh, you know, weren't great. So uh, I, I agree because based on the testimony today, I, I can't approve the transfer. So I'm, I agree with postponing it. Position on that. Commissioner. I'm sitting here listening to everybody make statements and I don't think you guys on this on my left are at fault. You live in, this, in the community and you're very concerned about your environment. And, 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 and when I put the two together uh, and for me to try to make a decision, I probably could, but I wouldn't be satisfied if I did make one today because there seems to be something missing. If the place was open, there should be someone who can attest to that fact. Get them to sign some document, or whatever. This document we have in the file, it's not stamped, it's not dated. Right. To me, it's not really official, but it's there. And no one didn't address it on our end, so maybe we could be held at fault too for not doing due diligence to this case. So maybe a postponement would be the best resolve at this time for this case. So I can Thank you. Can we get clarification on just one item? Yes. The, the time period in question. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's satisfied that from June of 2016 onward, we're okay. We're in compliance. It's prior to that date. Right. 15, it was 16. open and operating. And five affidavits from one witnesses or two witnesses that they were in that bar prior mm -hmm. to that date or over that time period. We'd like to have them here. Right. We've I'll do whatever we can. Right, right. We can testimony. hopefully satisfy that or get us further to the point where we could satisfy that. Right. Yes. Thank you. So and I would also, uh, sorry, I would also 
ask Mr. Akers to and Mr. Fossler to really work on this with both parties so we can get to some resolution. I know you guys do, but this is one, again, you shouldn't have to come back a third time. And t to the degree we're at fault, I apologize. I mean, we need to figure this out. So, right. Understood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize if it's for the record. Applicant okay. Exhibit 1, SFAT Certificate, Board Exhibit 1, Letter from Citizens of Picktown in Opposition dated June 2013, 2018. Board Exhibit 2, Letter from Citi Citizens of Picktown dated September 17, 2017 in Opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Next case. Well, next case, Robert Renger at the Port LLC, trading as Pickles at the Port, 6500 Riverview Avenue. There's a class BD7 beer wine liquor license. It's an application to transfer ownership, requesting outdoor table service. Before we get started, uh, bef whoever is going to testify, if we can have them sworn in, please. Ms. Witt. Sure, I am here on behalf of the St. Helena Community Association. Um, normally, you know, we would start with the, the person applying oh, for the transfer, oh, but we have an agreement, I, so. I apologize, I wasn't <laughs> sure. Um, Mr. Redinger, are you Mr. Redin Redinger? Okay, yes. please state your name for the record and. Robert Redinger. And you're here for uh, an application to transfer ownership requesting outdoor table service. Yes, ma'am. Correct? And this is a BD7 beer, wine, and liquor license. Uh, yes, correct. All right. And it sounds like you and Miss Witt have come to some type of agreement. Yes. <laughs> uh, is that something, and, and do you agree with the agreement? And uh, Yes, yes, we do. Is that an MOU? Yes, so it's a signed agreement um, on behalf of the licensee and also on behalf of the St. Helena Community Association. Um, it's pretty standard stuff, just keeping the place um, swept up and um, free of trash. Um, just there's going to be no live entertainment there because it, the building is located in an industrial, light industrial area, which does not allow live entertainment. Um, so that's in the agreement as well. Um, as far as outdoor tables go, um, they haven't finalized their where what those tables will look like and where and how many and that kind of thing it sounds pretty minor but so what the agreement says is that the association has to vote in favor of what the final outdoor tables will look like um, because that's still a little bit up in the air um, and but other than that it's just um, you know active communication between the parties um, and that's basically it so I can I have one signed copy we all have unsigned copies, um, this signed copy for the file. And Mr. Redinger, uh, do you, are you in agreement with the terms that are expressed in, in this MOU? Yes, ma'am. And, and you understand that this MOU will be attached to the license? I and do. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just saying I do. Okay. All right, and that um, you're agreeing to all the terms and uh, conditions set forth is that correct correct we're happy to work with the community one so uh, just to clarify on the license or the application rather it indicates I'm a little confused about the live entertainment so you're you're changing that to not offering live entertainment correct okay. yeah once we um, talk to the community we agreed you know in their, you know, in their favor, not to do live entertainment. Is, all right. Um, is it open right now? At the moment, no, it's not open. Okay. When do you intend to open it? Um, between August and September, if possible. Doing more construction, or doing some construction on uh, the property. We're uh, waiting on. Um, uh, hood vent estimate yes and will you be uh, managing the property or I will be yes and you will have 
those individuals who are employed with you uh, certified, alcohol awareness certified? Yes, we already do, yes. You already have that? Mm -hmm. okay, great. Questions? None. Any, uh, Mr. Redinger, any uh, issues at Whetstone Grill when you managed it or owned it? No. No violations, nothing? Nothing. Um, and how, just quickly so I understand, assuming we approve outdoor table service today, if I understood you, Ms. Witt, mm -hmm. They, uh, the licensee has agreed, or assuming he is approved, has agreed to go to you before as part of the MOU process. Yes, before any tables go outside, they will present us with kind of a diagram of where they will go and what they'll look like. Um, it sounds like maybe just a couple of small tables. So Great. Um, that will be voted on by the association before they go ahead. Great. Thank you. All right. Pam, did you want to testify? State your name for the record. Yeah, uh, Shirley Gregory, president of the St. Helena Community Association. Um, the I know the establishment that they took over is in really bad shape, so uh, I know they're doing their best to try to get it fixed up. Uh, the actual the community is actually thrilled that they're coming in to revitalize this particular piece of property um, because it used to be called the Airport Grill, which actually had significant because it used to be the Harbor Fields used to be there where planes used to land before it became the Port of Baltimore. Um, so it has a lot of history, so we really were hoping that it would stay in, in the community and still thrive. And so we're actually actually very excited about pickles at the port coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm not and sure about the color of the building, but, <laughs> <laughs> but no, we're all in favor of it. Great, thank you. Yeah. Any other testimony? No. Nope. All right. No. All right. I. Um, after reviewing the file and listening to the testimony today by Mr. Redinger and the community uh, and Ms. Witt, I am in agreement to um, uh, approve the application of this transfer uh, with the understanding that the MOU will be attached to the license. I concur. Uh, I too vote in favor of uh, transferring ownership um, subject to the terms of the MOU to the extent it's permitted by law. Um, and also just to comment, uh, Mr. Redinger, thank you for working with the community and thank you community for working together. You, you really did a great job in kind of addressing issues proactively, so I, I compliment you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I concur with that too. <laughs> right, I concur as well. <laughs> thank you. Good luck. Yes. I close it before the record. Community is it one MOU. Thank you. Next case, E. Michelle Jackson and Gloria Tyler Smertz, LLC, trading as Blairs on Hudson, 2822 Hudson Street. It is an application of transfer ownership and location of a class BD7 beer wine liquor license presently located at 3123 Elliott Street to 2822 Hudson Street under the provisions of Alcoholic Beverages Article 12-1706-B3, uh, small i, to too small I. Thank you. Mr. Maslin? Yes. Uh, Madam Chairman, members of the board, for the record, Gary Maslin, on behalf of the applicants. This is a uh, application to transfer two uh, licenses. Uh, this is Jack's Bistro's uh, is being relocated. I'm sorry, Mr. Graham wants I told him to bring the pancakes that you really like. Listen, off I'm going to, I'm going to, and listen, you really, I, 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 we're going to mention that at some point they're during they're this hearing off, or the next. They're off the menu, but. But it's, uh, a this, it's a travesty. This we're was actually off the first four uh, months of Mr. Uh, um, sorry, that's yes. my fault. Uh, sorry, sorry. Right. Right. that's my but fault. So if, if your clients are going to testify, let's have them right. sworn in right now. Sure. Raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. do. Uh, my clients went to the uh, community associations and received their full support as well as the business uh, associates for this move. It's basically taking a license from Hudson Street and moving it to the Jack's Bistro location, which has a currently has a seven-day 
location. And Jack's Bistro is relocating to Hudson Street so that this way they will have a seven-day license there. That seems like an easy thing to do. However, there was an um, unusual glitch in the law which prevented that from happening. And Senator Ferguson um, was extremely helpful because the community association went to Senator Ferguson together with our client and special legislation was introduced so that this license could be uh, moved with Senate Bill 118 to have a copy of the legislation. There's multiple other Thank you. Uh, legislation that was passed along with this um, legislation so that it can be accomplished. Uh, one of the things my client would like to do at Hudson Street is he'd like to have outdoor table service. The, the, the place was approved for eight outdoor uh, seating uh, by the uh, fire department. There's a uh, letter from the uh, permit from the fire department for, for the eight outdoor uh, table um, seats. Um, they're anxious to facilitate this and uh, uh, move forward. They're a very uh, good team member of the community and a big asset to the community and they've made substantial investments in the community. They purchased the, uh, the Hudson Street building and that's why they're relocating the Jack's Bistro to the Hudson Street. It's a property that's uh, family owned by my client. And will they be managing the establishment? Uh, nothing's changing. No. There's the same, same, same parties and going to be involved. Actually, it's their intent ultimately where the old Jack's Bistro was, was to uh, put that on the market and sell that location to another restaurant operator. I don't see the outdoor tables uh, on the application. Did I miss that? It, I, I think it was uh, omitted that when the application was filled out, unfortunately, it was not put on there. They went to the fire department after the fact and got the approvals. I don't know if we have to come back and submit an out another application for that. Can we, uh, we cannot. Uh, the law requires that if you're going to make an amendment uh, to an application, it must be done 15 days before the hearing. Uh, if you'd like, uh, we can post, I, well, I can defer to the, um, the board on that, but that's the law. Well, if it's 15 days, it's going to matter, matter to you. We need to get these permits and everything. If, if we could um, amend it, I, I can amend it and we could perhaps reschedule it. They still need to get some UNOs together uh, for the actual transfers and that's that can be done in the in the interim. That's fine. We can postpone this hearing. That's I actually just like to get this matter done now. Right. I, everybody needs to, I need your name. Vicky, you need to. Yeah. Tammy. Yeah. Stel Stel and you are? Estelle Michelle Jackson. My client's worried about the time. Uh, perhaps he could be excused the next time I'll amend the application and I'll appear on his behalf just for the purposes of the outdoor table services. Can we just deal with everything else and yeah. just yes. have that? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Appreciate Let's it. Thank you. I think we're on the same page. We'll uh, right. deal with the under and the table service. Yeah. <laughs> May I speak? Yeah, yes, sure. sure. Right. This is the second time. State your name Casey. for the record. Right. Theodore Stelz and Muller. I just want to bring up pancakes. It's the second time pancakes <laughs> caused me trouble in this room. So, <laughs> no trouble at all. I say it. I say it in the nicest way possible. All right. He promises to put them back on the menu. Yeah, that's fine. I had them on for four months, and I ate from. That's why. Please, um, state your name for the record. Estelle Michelle Jackson. Thank you. Miss Jackson, that's why the rest of us couldn't get them. <laughs> that's. Uh, I am fine with proceeding on, um, you know, one, whether we can approve the transfer and two, whether the, you know, well, one, whether under the new law we can approve the transfer and then two, under the factors we can approve the transfer and then doing, um, postponing the outside service to another hearing date. That's on our file amended application at the board. I agree. All right. So I... Uh, having heard, having reviewed the file and having uh, heard the testimony today, 
I am inclined to approve the transfer of ownership, I believe under um, Senate Bill 118, the board has the authority to do so. Um, and based on the factors pursuant to alcohol beverage article 4201-210A, uh, I believe the factors have been met. And so I vote to approve the transfer of the license. I concur with that. Madam, Madam Chair, can I just ask a few questions before? Oh, yeah. I apologize. No, that's right. No, <laughs> just to make sure we get that on the record. So you're currently, um, Blair's on Hudson's currently operating under a pre, you know, an existing license, which I think we'll get to shortly. Um, and so uh, there seems to be a public need and desire for, uh, for um, Blair's to remain open. Is that a, that's a question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, it currently is open and operating amongst several other licensees in the area. Is that true? That's correct. Um, so there doesn't seem to be much of an impact one way or the other uh, on the other licensees. Is that fair? No. And uh, you're using the same, I assume, with some exception, the same menu that you had at Jack's? Yes. Okay. That's so, correct. So it's remains common and unique in its own right. Um, and uh, have you ha had any violations at Jack's or at Blair's to date? 11 and a half years at Jack's Bistro, zero, and since January, zero at Blair's. Great. So, Madam Chair, uh, under uh, the authority uh, provided to us by the, the legislature and uh, based upon the, uh, the docket and the the testimony and evidence before us, I would vote to uh, approve the transfer of ownership and location of this BD-7 right, to 2822 Hudson Thank Street. you, Mr. Greenwood. Mr. Maslin, are you available on June 21st for I'll the hearing? I'll make myself available, okay. sure. For outdoor table service? For, to add, to amend the license, to amend the application. Who I'm needs sorry. to come then today? Just the carry or? Okay. No, we'll, we'll work it out. Well, okay. you can work it out, right? <laughs> Very much. Mr. Maslin, that's the evening docket, just so you know. Evening? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. As, 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 it, as in 6 o'clock in the evening? Correct. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Something new. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate Have a good day. Thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. County. We have to call exhibits before we can go to the next case, if you don't mind. I'll give you a slip there in one second. I call exhibits for the record. Advocate Exhibit 1, letter of support from Canton Community Association. Applicant Exhibit 2, Letter of Support from O'Donnell Square Business Association. Applicant Exhibit 3, Senate Bill 118. And Applicant Exhibit 4, Fire Prevention Permit. No. No. The record, I need to call the next case, okay. which is. Okay. It's the same thing. Same thing. Oh, because the record only reflected the first transfer. Okay. Right. Calling Theodore mm -hmm. Stencil Mueller, Blair Hospitality LLC, trading as Jack's Bistro, 3123 Elliott Street, Class D Beer Wine Liquor License, application transfer ownership and location of a Class D Beer Wine Liquor License, presently located at 2822 Hudson Street to 3123 Elliott Street, under the provisions of Alcoholic Beverages Article 12706B3, small i to 2 small i. And for the record, once again, uh, Gary Maslin on behalf of Theodore Selzmiller. Um, uh, Madam Chair, when I'd, I'd just like to if we could incorporate the prior testimony from the prior case as the testimony in this case, it's the same facts and circumstances, same letters of support, and same Senate bill which authorizes the transfer of uh, the license. Right, I, I have reviewed uh, the Senate bill and I, I, I agree that the Senate bill um, allows us to to approve or allows us um, allows consideration of this transfer. Uh, any questions, commissioners? I don't have any uh, questions either. So Mr. I'm in clarity. Oh. The Class D license is going from Hudson Street to 3123 Elliott. Is that correct? Okay. That's correct. Further questions? No. All right. Having uh, heard the, <laughs> the proffer from counsel and heard the testimony in the previous matter, uh, facts being the same, and after having reviewed the Senate Bill 118, which gives us authority 
and based on the questions from Commissioner Greenfield in the prior case as to the alcohol beverage article 4210A factors, I am satisfied that um, and will approve the application to transfer ownership of this Class D license located at 2822 Hudson Street to 3123 Elliott Street. I concur. I too uh, vote uh, based upon the proffer from Mr. Maslin, the um, facts and evidence that are the same from the previous case that was called. I too would uh, vote to support the transfer of ownership and location of this Class D license to 3123 Elliott Street. Good luck. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. I'd like to call exhibits for the record. App Exhibit 1, Love Support from Cannes Community Association. App Exhibit 2, Love Support from O'Donnell Square Business Association. App Exhibit 3, Senate Bill 118. And App Exhibit 4, Fire Prevention Permit. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Akras, any further? That concludes cases? our morning uh, docket, Madam Chair. We'll recess till? Till 115. 115 Thank for the you. afternoon docket. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chair, I apologize. Uh, this is the afternoon docket of the Board of Liquor License Commissioners for Baltimore City. Today's Thursday, June 14, 2018. If you have a phone or other electronic device, I would ask that you silence it or put it on vibrate now. When your case is called, Please step up to the podium, state your name clearly into the microphone. If you're going to be giving testimony, please be prepared to be sworn in by a court reporter all the way down at the end of the dais. Calling the first case, Paul A. Gordon, 419 East Baltimore Street Incorporated, trading as Jewel Box, 419 East Baltimore Street. There was a violation of the Alcoholic Beverages Rule 4.01A, sales to minors. Uh, and a violation of adult entertainment rule 3.05A, incorporation of liquor license rules and regulations to applicable licensees. All those parties that will be participating in this hearing, please step forward. For the record, Melvin J. Kadensky representing the licensee. Mr. Kadensky, is this a denial or admission? I won't give you the admission. Uh, I have a little argument on doctrine and merger, but I'll, I'll make it for the record. Thank you. Uh, whoever is going to testify, let's have them sworn in. Raise your right hand, you please. Your hand, yeah. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Kadinsky? Um, now you'll accept the um, report as into evidence, I'm assuming? Yes, yeah, okay. if this is an admission. Yeah, yeah, okay. yes. um, what I like to argue, one number one, I think it, when you read into the adult entertainment, it merges the rule from, from the liquor board. So I'd like to use the doc and the merger. It's all one event, one uh, system. The argument for the record. Um, this particular uh, place has not had um, a history for serving minors. Um, the last time they had anything was back in 2009-2010. Uh, had to do with adult entertainment, touching and stuff like that. Uh, that's not what um, this is. He uh, had a situation where the doorman left and then the bartender and they, they disciplined both of them. They're still working. He's having them take um, the alcohol awareness John Murray's gonna come in and have them all certified. Let me uh, stop you there. I thought you were making a motion first, a preliminary motion, so well, why don't we... Yeah, I would have to do it afterwards. Understood, okay, right. right. Why don't we read into the record the, um, report. the report. He's gonna do that on behalf Agent of the Agent Crystal Mouse, Baltimore City Liquor Board. On or about March 14th, 2018, at approximately 10.55 p.m., I, Agent Chris Amalis, working with Inspector Perez and Detective Greenhill and Gatto, while on the underage task force, visited the location at 419 East Baltimore Street in the city of Baltimore, State of Maryland. Once at the location, Cadet Bradford Day entered the establishment and ordered a Bud Light from the server, later identified as one Miss Sharp. Cadet Bradford Day used the departmental $20 bill to pay for the beer, which totaled $7, received his change, and notified the members of the task force. At that time, we entered the location, returned the beer back to Ms. Sharp, identified her using a Maryland identification, and retrieved the departmental $20 bill. We gave the change back to Ms. Sharp. We explained to her that she had served a minor, and we explained the process of the violation, performed a compliance check, then left the establishment without any further incident. When they were cooperative with you and when you were in there? They were. And um, 
This was a, a you didn't have any prior instances with regard to serving minors since you've been a, a inspector, have you? I, I couldn't tell. No, I was looking that. at the record here, so I'm just, you know. Yeah, if the record states that, I, I, I can't. how long you've been an inspector. I don't either. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Questions? No questions. All right, we the, will, ex go this ahead. This is where, I, mean, the, I think they've merged into being the same incident, same charge. I'll make the argument for the record. Understood. So having heard the uh, testimony of Agent Chris Mollis, um, I, I am satisfied that there was indeed in vi a violation of alcohol beverage rule 4.01A and 3.05A of the adult entertainment rule. And then we can go into well, I mean, your testimony, as, as I mentioned your argument. Before, uh, we submitted they haven't had prior uh, serving alcohol all the minors. Uh, anything they had, they've been in uh, existence. I uh, think uh, Paul says he's been down there 43 years. Doesn't look that old, does he? But he says he's been down there 43 years. Uh, it takes the wear and tear on him. And uh, he, the doorman left. Um, they should have checked. He disciplined them. They're still working. They're all going. He met with John Murray, who's going to have the rest of the people certified uh, for alcohol awareness. And like to think it was a isolated, isolated instance. I'm checking his record. Uh, as to your motion about merging the two rules, I find that the rules are separate, or that the, um, I'm, I'm going to deny that motion because I think under the rules there are two separate issues. I have to argue that. Understood. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything further? We need to submit other than what we've said. It's not a, a trouble place for serving minors. No questions? I have none. No. All right. Having heard the testimony from Agent Chris Mollis, uh, having reviewed the investigation report, having heard the proffer of counsel, I find that there is a violation of Rule 4.01A sales to minor on March 14, 2018, under the alcohol beverage rule. In addition, I find that there is a violation of the adult entertainment rule 3.05A, incorporation of liquor license rules and regulations uh, for March 14, 2018. And there, while this is the first, uh, looks to be the first violation in as to a sales to minors, there is a history of violations under this uh, current licensee this counts as the looks to be the third violation or this is the fourth violation actually um, granted the last one was in 2010 I find um, as to the first violation let me just I don't want to but that okay the third one you talked it was uh, dismissed that one you know, 4.18 or uh, since you conduct I just don't want to interrupt you but that thank you thank you probably yeah. when I was in my prime <laughs> you are correct uh, that was in 2009 and that violation was dismissed and the licensee I have to take into consideration the licensee has ha had this license since 1976 as to the first violation uh, $350 fine as to the second violation under rule 3.05 $350 fine Uh, I, too, uh, find a violation of Rule 4.01A uh, of the Alcoholic Beverage Rule. Uh, I, too, find a violation of, of Rule 3.05 Adult Entertainment, since they are, Mr. Kodensky, as you know, two separate licenses, liquor license and adult entertainment, so I find a violation of each based upon our rules, and I'll concur with the Chairwoman at $350 uh, for Rule 4.01A and $350 for Rule 3.05A under the adult entertainment uh, rules. I concur with the chair and the, and the commissioner. We all agree. Thank you. Okay. 30 days Thank to you. pay. Okay. I'll see you down here. Can I call the zippers for the record? Oh. 
Board Exhibit 1, Baltimore State Police Department report, Detective L.C. Greenhill. Board Exhibit 2, Investigation Report, Agent John Chris Mellis. Thank you. Next matter, please. Okay. Call the exhibits. Calling the next case, Scott Schluckner, SCS Holdings, LLC, trading as Social Pub and Pie, 25 East Cross Street. It's a Class BD7 beer, wine, liquor license, a violation of Rule 4.01A, sales to minors. All those parties involved in this case, please step forward. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. Commission, your please. Frank Schollis, representing the licensee. Uh, before you get started, if, if we have testimony, may I have everyone sworn in? Raise your right hands, please. Everyone who's going to testify, raise your right hand. Please swear. Go ahead and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. <laughs> Council, is this an admission or denial? I'm sorry. Is this an admission or denial? Admission. Thank you. I will have, who will testify on behalf of the agency to read the report into the record, please? Andy Perez, Baltimore City Liquor Board. March 14, March 14, 2018, I, Inspector Perez, along with Agent Chris Somales, working with the Baltimore Police Department, Detective Greenhill, Garrow, Sergeant Lesser, using uh, Baltimore Police Cadet Bravo Day, we arrived at uh, the establishment at 25 East Cross Street, known as Social Five Pop and Pie. Uh, Bravo Day entered the establishment and utilized an departmental $20 bill purchase a bottle of Bud Light for a total of. Um, I don't have the purchase price on my report. It was exchanged for the $20 bill. Uh, he notified the members of the task force of the sale when we entered and issued a violation for sales to minor, which was notified to the bartender, uh, Marisa Trilly. We left uh, the establishment, returned the beer, and uh, returned the change to the establishment. Thank you. Uh, having heard, any questions? Were they cooperative? Yes, they were. Right. Any other issues with them? No. Uh, having heard the um, uh, council's admission and the um, testimony of our agent, I find that there is a violation of Rule 4.01A, sales to minors, on March 14, 2018. Mr. Yeah, Commission, please. Uh, my client's very diligent in trying to avoid any minors coming in. His place is right in the Cross Street Square next to the market. Uh, but every once in a while, something will slip by. Uh, this is the Miss Trilla who did the actual serving. She has an alcoholic certificate. She has been trained. Thank you. Uh, she also manages the place. And between managing and waiting on tables on that particular night, she just slipped up. She's very apologetic, and, and believe me, I, I know this would not happen again. She knows what to look for. It was just she was a little overwhelmed, although it wasn't that busy. It was just she was trying to, they were about to close, and uh, they were just caught unawares. That's what happened, and we apologize. Uh, about two years before, a little more than two years, I think it was, there was also a, a charge serving minors. But uh, that's all since it was licensed. And that's from the previous licensee, too. It's never had one. Have they, and I, thank you for your proffer, uh, have, what else have they instituted to ensure that this ha well, doesn't happen has, again? Uh, Mr. Schlipner has regular staff meetings now. And as a matter of fact, he asked me for these papers so that he could show them to everybody at the staff meetings to emphasize to them the importance of carding and asking everyone what is going on and uh, making sure that this doesn't happen again. He, he's well aware that this is a high traffic area where young people try to sneak in. But if this one got by, he didn't come in with the group or anything. Came in a, a loner and you 
you know, when they try to sneak in, they usually <coughs> get the letter and you're more diligent. But, but he's taking every measure he possibly can. And he's talking about trying to get a driver's license scanner that he can keep at the door, especially when it gets busy. Does your client want to testify? I just wanted to say that I brought her here today so she could see the process and see the mistake that's been made and how it gets played out. And we're doing everything we can. We've had the tips training. We can do it again if, if need be. But I will work with her personally to make sure that we do we get better at this. And the training is for all your employees? I've had my whole staff trained in 2016 by John Murray, and I brought the, the copy there. But she made a mistake. You know, that's all there is to say. So we'll keep working on it. Any questions? Any other questions? No. Any questions? After having heard um, proper from counsel uh, and after having found a violation of Rule 4.01A, sales to minors on March 14, 2018, this is the second violation, as counsel noted for the record, within the last two years. Or, excuse me, this is the second violation of a sales to minors within the last two years, and this is actually the third violation within the last um, couple of years. So I'm going to issue a $600 fine. Would you consider a slight reduction of that? Uh, the reason I say this is, first, it was more than two years since the last violation, not within two years. It was heard in August, but the actual violation happened in the spring, as I recall. And the violation that you're referring to on the third violation, that was uh, uh, just where they were uh, bringing alcohol in that was purchased from a distributor, but not for that location. And they thought they could do it. It was an affiliate, but I, I appreciate I your stuck. argument. I, I appreciate know. your argument. Just for the record, the they appeared before the board on August twenty fifth, two thousand sixteen, for the sales to minors, and then the second violation was March thirtieth, two thousand seventeen, when they appeared before the board. The hearings were on those dates that I indicated. So, I six hundred dollars, thirty days to pay. My fellow commissioners might have a different. I find a violation of Rule 4.01A and would concur with uh, the chairwoman for a $600 fine. I concur also. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Charles. I would call the exhibits for the record. Board of Department Report, Detective Gatto. Board of Exhibit 2, Investigation Report, Inspector Andy Perez. I see Exhibit 1, Alcohol Awareness Certification. Thank you. Next matter. Mm -hmm. Calling the next case, Chris M. Ko and Chang E. Ko, uh, as personal representative, Song Cho Enterprises Incorporated, trading as OK Tavern, 2301 East Biddle Street. This is a class BD7 beer, wine, and liquor license, violation of rule 4.01A, sales to minors. Madam Chair, uh, John A. Pika, Jr., on behalf of Mr. Cho. Uh, why don't we have everyone sworn in, in case there's testimony, please? Raise your right hands, please. Uh, do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Counsel, is this a an admission or denial? Yeah, an admission. admission. Yes. All right. uh, who on behalf of who's going to testify as to the report? Thank you. On uh, 15 February of um, 2018 at 9.40 p.m., myself along with members of VICE as well as Liquor Inspector Clark uh, from the Bowman City Liquor Control Board conducted an underage sales to minor investigation at OK Tavern located at 2301 East Biddle Street. Also working with the Baltimore City Police Cadet Harris with a date of birth for 26 March 1998, making him 19 years of age at the time of the investigation. Cadet Harris, who was working in an undercover capacity, entered OK Tavern um, at 2301 East Little Street. Cadet Harris entered the establishment and purchased a 375 milliliter of Jack Daniels whiskey, which was priced at $13 from store employee Mr. 
Hung Mr. Young Park. Uh, Cadet Harris paid using the departmental $20 and received change. Cadet Air Harris exited the establishment and advised Detective Greenhill that he had just purchased alcohol from the establishment known as OK Tavern. At no time did Mr. Park ask Cadet Harris for proof of age. Detective Greenhill then notified other members of Vice as well as the liquor board and um, advised them that alcohol was just purchased. Uh, minutes later, Detective Gatto along with and Inspector Clark entered OK Tavern located at 2301 East Middle Street. Detective Gatto uh, recovered the, de the department of $20 and the change received was returned back to the bar. The inspector Clark photographed the Jack Daniels whiskey and returned it back to the bar as well. Detective Graham advised Mr. Park that he would not be criminally charged but a report would be written for the bar. The establishment left in the control of employee Mr. Park. Were they cooperative? Yes. Any issues with this establishment? No. You took away the one question I was going to ask. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. No exceptions to the uh, to the report. Thank you. Uh, well, after counsel's proffer and the uh, testimony of the violation, I find that there is a violation of rule and the admission of the violation. I find that there is a violation of Rule 4.01A sales to minors on February 15, 2018. Let's hear our argument on penalty phase. Sure. Thank you. Um, do you? Uh, I want to introduce these as exhibits. Uh, do you recognize these three? Photographs. Uh, first yes. of all, uh, could you? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Chris, Chris Show. Show. Thank you. Pardon me. Yeah. I'll put this up. And these are yeah. separate? Yep. Okay. And these separate. are these located or posted in spots, yeah. in locations where each individual who's purchasing alcohol can see them? Yes. Okay. Just to hand these to you. These are post um, notices in the establishment. I didn't They're hear the first part. Now. Of okay. Yes. And I need these back. Um, Madam Chair, because I was just handed these today, uh, are there two individuals who are employed who serve alcohol? Yes. And these are the two individuals right here? Yes. These are uh, alcohol awareness certificates dated June 7, 2018? Mm-hmm. Okay. Correct. Madam Chair, I just I need these back. Uh, oh, right. Well, there are several copies here of these. So. Thank you. We can... Um, that can be submitted for evidence. Oh. And these are the, uh, for the two, for two employees, are these only two employees in the establishment? Yes. Yes. One of those is here today, Mr. Park, who was working at the uh, tavern that evening. I'm sorry? Are you going to submit them into well, evidence? I can, or? I can send copies. They're the only copies that the, uh, the uh, owners have. Oh, all I right. I just wanted to bring them to your attention. Thank you. And put, just put them on the record, please. They'll be put on the record. Thanks. Can we just turn around and put these copies on there? Can we come to look at what we're talking about? Mm, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Can we just submit these in and have somebody stop by the liquor board sure. and pick them up? And get make copies we, for We're going to come by and for a, another issue, we can come by and get them on Monday. Okay. Uh, so we'll pick them up. Pick them up at Baltimore Street. Yes. 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 Okay. So they'll be submitted for the record, as evidence for the record. Any further testimony? I'm sure. I believe this is the only violation for serving minors in the last several years. Uh, I think there's a violation for that that goes back seven or eight years but nothing in the, in the recent future, I mean, in the recent past. And I would just ask for the, uh, I'll submit on that. I, this is the, uh, according to our records, this is the second violation, uh, a different kind, but this is, um, the first violation was under this licensee, which was transferred in 2010. The first violation was June 1st, 2017 for violation of uh, BD7, Class BD7 license. If I can, Madam Chair, that was an altercation that occurred, and the individual who was there at the time is no longer employed. Just so you know for when you're thinking through. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No. Commissioners? No. After hearing uh, the testimony, reviewing the file, and, um, and proper from counsel, I will impose an after fine in violation of Rule 4.01A, sales to minors, on February 15, 2018, uh, based on uh, the admission. I will impose, um, given that this is the second, this is the second violation, this first violation of a sales to minors, I will impose a $500 fine. 
I concur. I find a violation of Rule 4.01A and will concur with my colleagues for the imposition of a $500 fine. And 30 days to pay. Thank you. So, so, they, so they don't have a check today. We can bring that on Monday also. Right. Mm -hmm. Fine? Yes, that's fine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you can you. wash your car, too. Bring your car over. <laughs> we'll do it up, Mr. Peek, whatever you need. I was thinking of doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you. You personally going to wash it? For you, the world. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you kindly. I can take these, sir? Thank you. Mr. Pika. Mr. Pika. Mr. Pika. Sir. Thank you. I thought it was for the record. Okay. Board of Civic 1, Baltimore State Police Department report, Detective L.C. Greenhill. Board of Civic 2, Investigation Report, Inspector Daryl Clark. Light C. Exhibit 1, three total photos. Light C. Exhibit 2, two alcohol awareness certifications. Thank you. Calling the next case, uh, Priscilla Irisari and Blanca Pesquera, Ecstasy Bar and Restaurant, LLC, trading as My Cousin's Place, 39 Two five through two seven East Lombard Street. There's a class BD seven beer, wine, and liquor license violation of Rule three point one two General Welfare on April seventh, two thousand eighteen. A violation of Rule three point one two General Welfare on April eighth, two thousand eighteen, and a violation of Rule three point one two General Welfare on April twentieth, two thousand and eighteen. All parties that are involved in this matter, please come forward. Be prepared to testify. Do you, do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Kadensky, uh, please state your name. For the record, Melvin J. Kadensky, I, I don't challenge what was written in the report. I, I do have an argument with regard to whether or not it, it meets the uh, standard of um, public welfare, uh, and I'm making I'm proffers that I, I did talk with the inspector. I knew that um, at one time, I guess must be have an austere budget at this point that you used to have uh, a decibel meter that you would, not you personally, but the board would go out and, and, and use, see if it violated the Baltimore City Health Department um, violations. Uh, I know they have one, but they don't use it, but I don't contest what they say happened. My argument is whether or not it meets the standard, and I j just a few questions of the inspector and that'll be it. Right, uh, why don't we, put the um, the violations, the incidents in the record first. Andy Perez, Baltimore City Liquor Board. I just want to make a clarification on my report. Made a mistake. Uh, the date of the incident was April 7, 2018, not April 7, 2017, as I wrote. Uh, oh, I see. Thank you. Okay, on the night in question, I responded to the 311 complaint 18 7261 for alleged loud music and customer from the establishment urinating in public. At approximately 11.52, I responded to my cousin's place located at 392527 East Lombard Street. Upon arrival, I parked my car on the corner of East Lombard and South Grand Street, where I have full view of the establishment. From this location, I, I was able to hear excessively loud music emanating from the establishment. Furthermore, one individual was observed urinating against the wall from the establishment approximately 10 feet away from the main entry door. I instructed the licensee, Ms. Blanca Pesquera, to lower the music, which she imme immediately complied. I also advised her to place security personnel outside of the establishment to avoid customers from urinating in public. At this time, Ms. Pescara informed me that th there was nothing she could do about it. Let me just, I'm gonna just take one at a time. Yes, let's okay. do that. All right, but and the, as far as the, the uh, volume, you didn't have any way to measure the decibel. I did not, but I was, I was able to hear the volume across the street, yeah. the, the, the nearest resident to the establishment. Well, what kind of music was it, was it? I can't remember. Oh, okay. And, uh, but you do have a decibel reader in, in the office? I've seen one before. Okay. And uh, along with, um, when you went over, they did cooperate and lower the music for you? Uh, the first time they did. Yeah. And then the, the fellow who was, or I guess it was a gentleman, did, was doing the urinary, did he actually come out of the place? Yes, he did. All right. And um, when they were, did you say anything to him? Not that you had to. Uh, as far as the music. No, uh, no, no, come with the urinary. I did. You did? I flashed my flashlight on him, and he said, I'm sorry. Okay. Anything further? 
Is this the one you're? Um, well, the, the all three of them, or just mostly have the same argument from all the three of them. Because right. the next one happened the same night, but it flowed into the next day. Right. Uh, yeah. um, why don't we go to the second violation, please? Okay. After I spoke to Ms. Blanca, Ms. Blanca Pesquera, I went to the uh, establishment next door to check on, on their music as well. Uh, upon returning to my vehicle approximately 11.25, I noticed the same issue again at the establishment. Loud music, loud music emitting from the establishment and two patrons coming out from the back door urinating near the dumpster that was on South Ground Street. Um, again, I made contact with the DJ, uh, Mr. Noel, and uh, Ms. Blanca Pesquera told her my observation and informed that a violation will be written. And on I told you that the place where the dumpster is around the corner, is that yes, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, then regarding the uh, DJ, you had indicated to me when we talked that in the past you had a sufficient cooperation with him, but for this night somehow he, he was yes. sort of out, uh, just of sorts. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But there were no, in both these, there was no arrest or no. anything. I didn't, maybe you did talk with the licensee. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, the dumpster, it's oh, it's on the property. It's around the corner. Am I following that? It's around the corner on the sidewalk. Okay. Are there lights? There's no lights on that side of the street. Thank you. Anything else? Um, no. If you all do right. the next one, and I'll Let's make the same argument that all at one time. All right. That's fine. Um, yeah. Thank you, Agent Fossler. Chief Inspector Mark Fossler, Balmer City Liquor Board. On April 20th, 2018, Liquor Board staff, including myself, Agent Krista Miles, Inspector Perez, were participating in operations with the Social Club Task Force. Uh, that included uh, the vice unit uh, members, Sergeant Lesher, Detective Gatto, Detective Greenhill. Uh, Cal housing Code Enforcement, Fire Department, and the Health Department. Uh, the uh, members of the uh, of the uh, Vice Unit and the Liquor Board initiated an inspection at Trio uh, 3907 East Lombard Street uh, at approximately <clears throat> 11, 12 p.m. I was on the north side of East Lombard Street and clearly heard loud music emanating from my cousin's place, 3925 East Lombard Street. As a result of numerous community complaints, the Liquor Board st staff had pre previously warned and violated this establishment for li live music. At that point, I instructed Agent Christomalis to issue a loud music violation, and we explained the violation to the operator, uh, Bianca Isabel. After issuing the violation, we departed at approximately 11.50 p.m. And I wanted to point out to the board, based on the questions from council, our standard operating procedure, while we do have a, uh, a sound meter, a standing operating procedures just have us use the reasonable person concept of that if, if we're at a, a certain distance or can hear that the music is clearly uh, too loud that we uh, will issue a violation. Thank you. Any questions for Agent well, Fossler? When you went there, were they cooperative with you to um, talk with Ms. Blanca? Yes, sir. Yeah. I, and then the uh, only reason why I, I bring this up is because I go back, maybe you, one of you are too young to remember the days of the old Bohagers, when Bohagers had the outdoor and they used to require them to take decibel readings from the four corners of the place because it was an outdoor, you know, and they used to go by the Baltimore City Health Department uh, rules, decibel rules. Um, I sort of uh, put this in of whether or not it's loud is the same thing as what the standard of loud means um, because, you know, there's a statute that says that you can be found guilty of spinning wheels in your car. The question is, does it spin once, twice? There's really no standard for it. I don't have any problem in, in what the inspector said they heard what they thought was loud music. My argument is a little different than that. And uh, regarding the, the urination, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to put it all together, but I, I don't know what you could, anybody could do, and an individual citizen could do. Um, once you make your findings, I can tell you some things that they have decided, but I'll at least make the um, argument. We won't submit any more, any evidence. Agent Perez. 
questions. I have something else to add. Uh, for this particular location, we were getting at least one to two complaints each week. And um, ever since these two violations were issued, I think I've only seen uh, one complaint come through the 311 system. Thank you. You've seen, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Just one. One complaint. Ever since the second violation was issued. Understood. I understand um, your argument, Mr. Kaninsky, but I, I find that um, pursuant to the rules that um, these violations or that um, these these violations meet the standard under the rule of general welfare so I'm, I'm going to deny your motion do we know what the um, general welfare violation was what, of what nature it was from December of 2016 do we have any information on that can't tell from our. Yeah, I don't think I did that one either. No. One second. There was one that there was a disturbance with a security guard. I don't know if you were on the board at that time when the security guard got hit, punched, and then eventually had to make a report later the next day. That may be the one you're talking about. The security guard, is that the one that he got hit? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought it was one. Four fifteen. General welfare. There's an altercation, it was a fight. Security guard, I remember, and, and he went home, and then, you know, he wanted to report it like the next day, but it, nobody denied it didn't happen um, in the place. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? No. After. Uh, when you, if you're finished, I got something about oh. disposition. When you're, I don't know whether the other two have made the same finding, commissioners, that is, I'm sorry. Finding on each violation, right? Right. right. Yeah. Um, why don't we? Oh, I, I find a violation of Rule 3.12 General Welfare on April 7, 2018. I also find a violation of Rule 3.12 General Welfare on April 8, 2018, and I find a violation of Rule 3.10 General Welfare on April 20, 2018. I, I'm, I'm going to allow counsel oh, to I'm gonna testify. I want you to make your fine. I want to give you some things in mitigation if I can. I concur. All three charges. Okay. I find a violation of Rule 3.12 on April 7th. I find a violation of Rule 3.12 on April 8th. And I find a violation of Rule 3.12 on April 20th. Counsel? It, in, in this particular instance, I think it's one of the other uh, inspectors that they're right next door to another place the VIP room have similar um, clientele not that that gives them any other privilege or so forth um, but they're right on a corner and on that corner they, they have a pretty good lighting except when you go around the, uh, the side there um, what they're going to do from now on is uh, they're going to make sure their security watches outside and they got a videos and if they see someone outside who are their clients their customers urinating they will then tell them there's no need for that because they have bathrooms they tell them they're no longer you know wanted as customers however they said there are times when people come from the other place and walk around to the back alley uh, to where it's darker on the side uh, so they're going to watch uh, the video they have four people who are going to be working security now um, they'll watch the uh, uh, videos 
And uh, what they're going to do is on the sound, if it's all right with the board, uh, they're going to put a regulator or governor on it. And um, I would ask that they, uh, since uh, um, Inspector Perez is able to communicate with, maybe go to the establishment and sit across the street and let them take it and lock it in at the highest volume that you know won't disturb anybody. You can make sure to keep the doors uh, the doors closed. So if they go ahead and uh, agree to put the regulator and the governor on there, then that would be. Uh, yeah, where you couldn't go in. We had this in the past where they would do a jukebox and so forth. They would put a regular governor where no matter what, whoever was in there, if they liked the song, it was their birthday, you know, whatever it is, they can't go beyond that, that, that amount. And uh, she'd be a little bit more um, uh, vigilant with regard to that. The urination causes a problem because it's not just with her, it happens a lot in the city, but I, I don't know how an individual licensee can do anything with them other than say you're not welcome as my, um, as my customer. Uh, I used to have the same thing with the Bay Cafe where people would leave there and two blocks away they would decide to urinate on somebody's steps and said, I can't follow the guy up the corner with a pee cup or something like that, I just can't. But what they, they can do is they can say we don't want you as a, as a, as a customer. Um, but they will be more vigilant and watch to see are they our customers and if they so, you're not going to come in here anymore. And uh, B, with regard to the music, they'll um, agree the, to uh, put a regulator and if the somebody from the board would come over and say, listen, this is acceptable, and use that. And as mentioned, um, since that date, there's only one um, follow-up complaint, so they are more vigilant than that. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Right. Um, having heard proffer of counsel uh, and having a violation as to the first rule 3.1, 3.12 general welfare April 7, 2018, I find I will impose a $250 fine. As to the second violation on of rule 3.12 general welfare April 8, 2018, I will impose a $250 fine. And as to the third violation on April 20th, 2018, 3.12 general welfare, I will impose a $250 fine for $750 fine total with 30 days to pay, plus the 125 in administrative fees. I concur. Uh, I, too, find a, vi a violation, as I said, of Rule 3.12 on April 7, 2018, and would agree with the imposition of a $250 fine. I would also agree with the imposition of a $250 fine for Rule 3.12 on April 8th as well as a $250 fine of, for rule, violation of Rule 3.12 on April 20th, 2018. Thank you. Okay, now, I'll call the office, but maybe, would you be willing to do that? Yes, okay. Yeah, okay, and then we'll take it in, in the evening and see if that takes care of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call the episode of the record, Board of Civil 1, Investigation Report, Inspector Andy Perez, Board of Civil 2, Investigation Report, Chief Inspector Mark Foster. Thank you. For the record, Madam Chair, uh, the next case, Terrence Hostin and Casey Jenkins, Birdland Sports Bar and Grill, LLC, trading as Birdland Sports Bar and Grill, uh, for, the, for their violations of this matter was postponed and will be set in on a future date. And going to the last matter, Madam Chair. Yes, please. Calling Sarah Coughlin. Lindy Promotions Incorporated, trading is Lindy Promotions, 3645 Beach Drive Boulevard uh, is a pub tour license. Violation of Alcoholic Beverages Article 12101.1D2, 3I2, Violation of Alcoholic Beverages Article 12101.1E, Violation of Rule 4.16, Illegal Conduct, Violation of Rule 3.12, General Welfare. Violation of Alcoholic Beverages Article 12.1101.1, D2, uh, three small i, three. Violation of Rule 4.16, Illegal Conduct. Will all parties uh, that wish to testify in this matter please step forward. And why don't we, everyone raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Good afternoon. Stephen W. Fogelman on behalf of the license holder. Um, this is an admission. Oh. As to each yes. violation? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Um, anyone want, who wants to testify um, put on the record the violations? Agent Chris Malice, Baltimore City Liquor Board. On March 10th, 2018, I, Agent Chris Malice, while on duty, arrived at the Federal Hill area, specifically the Cross Street area. Once I arrived, I, observe, I observed Cross Street from Trawl Street. I observed Cross Street from Trawls to Light closed with bike racks. Once I walked inside the closed perimeter, I observed patrons of the pop crawl with uh, plastic cups containing alcoholic beverages and bottles containing beer. I asked security to speak with the representative from Lindy Promotions, and one Sarah. Coatlin came out and met me. I asked her for all the permits and she provided me with DOT permits and liquor board permits. None of these licenses and or permits allowed for alcohol to be sold and or consumed outside. Ms. Sarah told me that she did not know anything about extension permits and that she only knew about the permits to close the street. At approximately 4.30 p.m., there were two bottles that were thrown on Cross Street. At that time, I thought that there was a public safety issue and I instructed the security at every establishment on Cross Street, on the Cross Street side, not to allow anyone with a cup or a bottle to exit the location. By 5.15 p.m., there was no alcohol that I could see on the Cross Street side. Did you have any questions? No, no, not for uh, the inspector, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the second violation, please. Oh. Oh. We have a representative from the permits from, oh, that could great. testify to what permits were pulled. Thank you. Uh, Hello. Please state your name for the record. Michelle Abbott Cole. Um, I'm operations officer with Department of Transportation. You may need to. Oh. Michelle. Abbott Cole. How do you spell Abbott? A B B O T T, like Abbott and Costello, and Cole. <laughs> You're too young to know. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Who's on first? <laughs> Who's on first? Um, so um, the folks from Lindy came in to the office January 10th, um, 2018, to submit an application for a pub crawl. Um, January 24th, uh, we held a citywide logistics meeting with all of our city partners that would assist um, with the event, at which point there were, it was determined that there would be no street closure. Um, and that there would be no alcohol sold in the street. Um, I guess that would be it. So a permit was issued um, for the event holder mid-March, and um, I'm sorry, mid-February, and that permit allowed no street closure, no alcohol to be sold. When was that? I didn't catch a date. That was mid-February. February. And, and what was mid-March? Mid-March was, um, March 10th. Yeah, March oh, oh, 10th the, was the, the violation. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Got it. Thanks. Any, oh dear. hold on once. Any questions? Yes, very briefly, Ms. Abbott Cole. Thank you. Um, so, in fact, the applicants, uh, and I believe it was almost at your recommendation, they, they did pay the $4,800 for the street closure, right? Hold on a minute. There was the street closure, but no alcohol. Right. So in the application where it says, um, will there be alcohol served? Uh, were there, do, you plan to sell, do you plan to sell beer, wine, or liquor? Participating bars and restaurants plan to serve alcohol and other beverages within their venue only. And that, didn't, that, that doesn't include the street. The street, the outside. No. Right. So the permit was for the street closure. The reason that we request the street closure is because the crowd gets like out of control. So they're going to close the street anyway. So we would like to be proactive and have that street closed for the crowds. But no alcohol was to be sold in the streets. And Ms. Abbott Cole, you've worked with Lindy Promotions on other events, yes. haven't you? Yeah. And they've done business in the city for for 10 years to the best to, to the best of your knowledge I've right I've been in position for four and a half so yes exactly since I've been here. so uh, in those other instances over the past four and a half years uh, have you found them to be uh, in compliance with the law they've been generally good actors great thank you very much thank you and then uh, let's move on to the second violation can someone put that in the record okay. 
Uh, based on uh, Chief Inspector Mark Musler, uh, Baltimore City Liquor Board. Uh, the, the day prior to the event, uh, which would have been Friday, the event took place on Saturday, on Friday, March 9, 2018, uh, approximately 12.28 p.m. After I received an email from community residents concerning the Federal Hill Hour stroll, which was scheduled for the next day, and uh, I requested some additional information, and after confirming that the information uh, came from lindypromotions.com, I determined that Lindy Promotions was advertising venues and activities that were not included in the original application to the Liquor Board and the Department of Transportation. Uh, the uh, the Lindy uh, website advertised one star country club, uh, uh, another uh, establishment as a participant in this stroll, uh, which is a clear violation of the uh, pub tour license PTP 011, and that changes to the participants cannot be made less than 30 days from the scheduled event. Uh, the website also included a beer garden in the advertising, and as stated by uh, Ms. Abbott Cole, that there wasn't there wasn't supposed to be anything outside. That the, all the alcohol was to be at the participant inside the participating venues. Um, the participating bars and restaurants. Uh, as she already stated, plan to serve alcohol and other beverage within their venues only. I called Lindy Promotions at approximately 1.15 p.m. and spoke to Samantha. I directed Lindy to move references to the establishment, uh, trading as uh, One Star Country Club, uh, which they which they did. I also instructed Lindy to remove any references to the beer garden in their advertising. Uh, and I explained, uh, reviewed the DOT application uh, stating that the uh, within their venues only. Um, I ex further explained that, there, that the liquor board wasn't granting any, av any extensions to any establishments uh, for this stroll. And because there would be no beer garden and no alcohol on the street because the street was only being closed for public safety. Um, on March 9th at approximately 1.49 p.m., the problem advertising had been removed from lindypromotions.com. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fulton. Thank you. Yes, just briefly, uh, Chief. Um, who were the community residents who emailed you that was the uh, genesis of this entire complaint? You know... Uh, <laughs> I don't. Yeah, oh. All right, uh, my, my question is for the chief. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I, I usually don't give out the names of people, but if, if the board wants me to do so, I mean, if they don't. I, 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 <laughs> it sounded like. Um, if they're willing, they were, if the community residents are, 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 are happy with me to reveal that information, I will do so. Okay. You can't speak yet. Okay. All right. And uh, Chief, that so those yes, uh, sir. residents were? Um, Mr. and Mrs. Valeri. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. Okay. Chief. Uh, to expedite this, if, if your client is admitting to all the violations, um, we can, so you can submit on these violations so that we don't have to go through We'll One submit on nine. the violations. Right. Clearly, there's there's right. interest in mitigation and possible cross-examination of witnesses still, though. Okay. But as far as the violations having been established, we submit on those. On all violations. Right. All right. Well, I, um, I'm ready to rule on finding a violation, uh, and then we can go into mitigation. So as to the... F well, they're admitting to the violations. You can testify as to mitigate, but as to, what is your name? to penalty phase. Barbara Valeri, V A L E R I. All right, so I, uh, as to the first violation of alcohol beverage 12 1101.1D232, or um, 
little I3. Uh, March 9, 2018, I find that there is a violation as to violation of alcohol beverage, Article 12-1101.1, little e. March 9, 2018, I find that there is a violation as to rule, um, violation of Rule 4.16, illegal conduct on March 9, 2018, find that there is a violation as to violation of Rule 3.12, general welfare on March 10, 2018, find that there is a violation. As to the next violation of alcohol beverage, Article 12-1101, little d, two, uh, three eyes, three, March 10, 2018, I find that there's a violation. And as to, finally, as to uh, violation of Rule 4.16, legal conduct on March 10, 2018, I find that there's a violation. I guess I'll go next. Oh. I too find a violation of alcoholic beverage article 12-1101.1, small d, two, small th three, small i's, two, on March 9, 2018. I also find a violation of the alcoholic beverages article 12-1101.1e. I also find a violation of our rules, rule 4.16 on March 9th, as well as a violation of 3.12 general welfare on March 10th. I also find a violation of the alcoholic beverage article 12-1101.1D23, small i's, 3, on March 10th, 2018, as well as another violation of Rule 4.16 on March 10, 2018. <laughs> I'm not going to read all that. <laughs> <laughs> I concur with the six findings by the uh, chair and the commissioner. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Goldwoman, mm -hmm. please. Uh, my client, well, first of all, this is the first time for this. Though. We've never had a hearing for a pub crawl before, a public hearing. And so um, it's sort of uncharted territory, if you ask me. My client, Lindy Promotions, has an incredible track record as a responsible event operator. Over 10 years in business in over 15 cities, New York, Washington, Philadelphia, Boston, Atlanta, Miami, Chicago, San Diego, Los Angeles, Orange County, California, San Francisco, London, Montgomery County, Harford County, Worcester County, and Baltimore County, and indeed Baltimore City. They have worked with local governments to help them find best practices in other cities where they've operated and even helped craft regulations in Washington, D.C., for example, as someone who had a lot of experience in managing these events in the past. They worked with Councilman Jim Kraft for years in the Canton Community Association when they did all of their events. I did speak with the former president of the CCA, Canton Community Association, Sean Flanagan. He told me he would be sending an email to Mr. Akris and Mr. Page explaining their compl uh, uh, Lindy's compliance with the laws during the period that he chaired that association. I don't know if it's arrived. I did not get a CC. Um, what happened here was regrettable, and my clients have expressed nothing but remorse and contrition since their failures. It all started when DOT suggested that they close down Cross Street for easier pedestrian access, something they hadn't done in a few years. They, they said, sure, no problem, I paid the $4,800 to get it done. They knew they weren't permitted to have alcohol out there, and this is where it got confusing for the operator of this event. One of the operators on Cross Street told a representative of Lindy Promotions that he had secured the necessary permits and that there would be alcohol permitted on Cross Street. Uh, the young lady who, who was working the event apparently asked for further assurances from the operator on the day of the event and told, was told that it was under control and that operator mentioned that he had an email from the liquor board. This young lady ended up losing her job with Lindy Promotions for not doing her due diligence in the matter. And this company has accepted full responsibility for their failures. Um, this is the first time in the 10, 11 years of this business in multiple jurisdictions that they've had to stand before a tribunal accusing them of any kind of wrongdoing. And they're horrified, and they've been horrified about this since March 10th. The first thing that they did when this happened was that they, had a, they had apparently, I was not involved then, had a meeting 
with the representative of the liquor board, um, at which time it was suggested by that person, maybe you shouldn't put any permits in for a while. And so they said, absolutely, we won't put a single permit in for any event until this situation is resolved. So they haven't put in a permit with the city of Baltimore for any kind of event since March of 2018 and as of today. So there are July 4th events and other events that they would have had that they have foregone as a result of this um, situation because they didn't want to they basically put themselves on probation in order to investigate their shortcomings in this matter and haven't applied for a permit since March. Um, we also had a meeting with the entire administrative st staff at the Liquor Board and the Inspections Division leadership to explain the ways uh, that they won't allow this situation to ever happen again. And so now it's my turn to tell you what they're doing to make sure this never happens again. And as we told the staff, the very first thing that they're never going to do again is to take legal advice from anyone other than their local council and possibly from the uh, deputy executive secretary of the agency. They're certainly not going to take advice from operators of establishments. They've hired me and I'll be on call with them during these events. That There's only a few of them a year here in Baltimore. Second, they have modified their contracts. Well, they haven't modified it yet because they haven't, they haven't they had an event in Baltimore City since this happened, but they are, I will be modifying their contracts in boldface to make it clear to licensees that sign on to these events that they must provide proof of any necessary permits if there will be any drinking outside of the licensed premises of the operators who sign on. And in fact, saying that if you don't give us a copy of your liquor board extension permit within three days of the event, you're dropped from the event. Uh, the bottom line is they can't pull those expansion permits. Um, they can only, they have a pub crawl. They're licensed for the pub crawl, but it would be up to the individual operators um, in this case, I think there's f there were five participating bars on Cross Street, the, cross, the north side of Cross Street, which was closed. So the responsibility was for the five operators to get that permission. Like I said, they, uh, an employee of this company took the word of an operator that turned out to be less than factual. Um, they relied on that to their detriment, and for that, they feel terrible. Um, the next thing that they're, they're doing is they've reached out to the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association, who they're going to keep in touch with during all future events in the community. They met with the Federal Hill Board last night, President uh, Beth Whitmer here, the uh, board members here, um, and they're going to work with them in the future. Um, also, it's my understanding that the Federal Hill Main Street Group is now handling all festivals in the neighborhood, not the licensees organization. So there will be, there is a group that they will be working with that don't just that aren't just all bar owners in the future and so they're hoping that the communication cell phone numbers being exchanged is going to alleviate these problems um listen i was at the federal hill neighborhood association board meeting last night and i was very impressed with the hard work that the volunteers do for their community um i learned that there was kind of a, a rift in the community association, they used to have a liquor advisory committee that the, that the Federal Neighborhood Association decided to disband and reform it as the business regulatory committee because they didn't think they needed to necessarily be hostile to liquor license establishments just by their very name that all, they want to police all businesses. And, and, and so the vast uh, majority of the membership of the association uh, thought the committee should be focusing on all businesses in the neighborhood. Apparently, um, a couple people were not happy with that, and I think there's this splinter group now, um, the Baltimore Good Neighbors Coalition, and I, at this point, would like to reserve um, until I hear from the folks to my left. You want your clients to testify? Yes, that? Mr. Gable would just like to make a brief statement. He's the president. Ms. Sarah Co Coglin, it's pronounced Coglin, she's here. She is the license, was the permit holder. Um, she is an employee of. And the, do they want to testify? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, but before you testify, state your name for the record, please. John Gable. I want to okay. John Gable. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time to meet with us. Um, my dad taught me that the fish thinks from the head. That's why. 
we're submitting to all the charges and excuse is an excuse. Um, at the end of the day, hindsight is always better. Um, Mr. Fogelman outlined why, what happened, happened. Um, it will never happen again, 100%. The way that I found out about this, just so you know, was after St. Patrick's Day, I had taken it upon myself to meet with every single person within the city to talk about how to better the process. It was at that time I had had a very productive meeting with Michelle, which I always do, and then it was at that time Michelle and I were talking. We said, oh, we're just going to meet with Mr. Akris. <coughs> but I had gone over to Mr. Akris's office to meet with him to talk about how to better the relationship and how we can do better, honestly not even knowing that like what's happening today was going on. He had then informed me of the circumstances, and I was shocked, and I said, absolutely, I want to meet with, we had a whole meeting with his entire team before this. Um, I said, I want to meet with them, I want to resolve the problem. Um, we've been incredibly proactive, um, and uh, we met with the Neighborhood Association last night. Um, since day one in the city, I have been incredibly proactive with being a partner with the city. I have gone before Michelle and ICE meetings, um, before the liquor permit, because it's, it's new. So before it even existed, I have put in permits, as Michelle could attest to, that she would say to me, you don't even need to put in this permit. And I said, well, I'm doing it anyway, just so you know that we're good partners. Um, so that's years ago that we've been doing that, and we will continue to be good partners. At the last meeting with the Liquor Authority, um, I, some of the members had said that they're forming a group to also better their process. I volunteered to be on that, which I've been on that process in other markets to help improve the process. I did work with Councilman Kraft and Councilman Costello, bringing in best practices with other markets to help even create the law that I'm you know, before right now. Um, I have a direct email now with Mr. Akris, who has been you know, a pleasure to work with and been very direct and helped me with you know, directing, well, here's some SOPs that are on the website. Um, I have Mr. Fogelman, who will be involved in every single event. Nothing will happen moving forward without the two of them, not just my attorney, but I plan to make sure that Mr. Akris is looped in on everything. Um, and lastly, the, the neighborhood is also looped in on everything that we do. Um, we have also volunteered to do other events in the market um, in Fed Hill, and also we do Canton, just so you know, we do Fells Point too, that have nothing to do with alcohol. Uh, we proposed an event for the retail stores um, to drive business for that. We've proposed an event for uh, a children's Halloween crawl that is based upon candy and juice. Um, so we are extremely proactive. Now, as long as the neighborhoods take me up on it, we're there. It's not a profitable event for us. We do it pro bono, but in, in pretty much every market that I'm in, uh, you know, they'll turn around and they'll say, this is a guy that goes above and beyond. Um, and I do that because we're long-term. We're long-term players. I've been in business for over 20 years. Um, I have a lot of experience. I'm a family person. Um, I'm a disabled vet, technically. I'm not here for to do an event, you know, and just leave the city of Baltimore and not, you know, come back six months later and see what happens. I'd like to be here for the next 20 years or until, you know, hopefully I maybe could stop one day. <laughs> but uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want? Um, um, no, that that that'll be the balance. And just uh, I'll just like to make a brief closing after the the testimony's in. Great, thank, thank you, you. Miss Valeri. Mm -hmm. Thanks. It's Barbara Valeri. I'm a resident of the Otterbine Federal Hill area, and uh, my husband and I initiated the the complaint um, that that resulted in the a number of the violations, although not those of the actual day of the of the event. Um, let me first say that that um, the reason we're here today is because there was a pub crawl law that was passed and went into effect in mid-2016 because pub crawls were out of control in Baltimore City. Uh, a group of neighbors in the Federal Hill area, myself and my husband included, uh, promoted 
uh, a legislation with with our representatives um, councilman Kraft was was also involved in that legislation and I guess you you testified that that Lindy's was also part of that that uh, drafting and negotiation on the on the law soon after that law and and because it was it was a total mess and it was a it was a an Irish pub crawl that of, uh, where 8,000 people, 8 to 10,000 people showed up in Federal Hill. The application said they expected to have 400 people at this event. So security for, for 400 go to 8, eight to 10,000 people. The law goes into effect in mid-2016. mid, mid um, Since that time, um, Lindy's, Lindy Promotions has consistently been in violation of the law. The liquor board, I believe, has been extremely lenient in, in terms of, of not citing them for violations in the past. Started with the Halloween uh, event in 2016, uh, where they did not get their paperwork in on time. They were given a pass because they didn't know the law, even though they said that they had helped to draft the law. Uh, in your packet, you should have a February 2018 letter sent from the from the liquor board uh, to Lindy Promotions. It's a cease and desist letter that says you're advertising and selling tickets to the Irish Stroll event. You don't have a permit. Cease and desist. They didn't get cited with a violation. Uh, again, we noted that as before the uh, event took place, they were advertising. Uh, a, an establishment that was not part of their permit. So we notified the, the liquor board. We don't want to do this. We don't want to be the enforcers of the law. That shouldn't be our job. We want to help in the, in the planning stages. We want to make sure that events come off, off well, that there's proper security, that there, whatever uh, medical personnel or other facilities are required are there. We don't want to be the enforcers. But in this case, we noted the, the uh, issue and we uh, related it to Chief Inspector Fossler. He followed up on it, and he found that we were correct. Now, the following day, we did go down to the, uh, the uh, event itself. And you should have in your, in your packet <coughs> an email called Federal Hills St. Patrick's Day Pub Crawl from um, Hank and myself, my husband and myself, to uh, Mr. Page, Mr. Akris, and Chief Inspector Fossler. And if you don't have that, I can. They do. It's I Exhibit can, Six. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, in it, uh, you know, we go down to to uh, the event, and we find that indeed uh, the cross street is barricaded off. We attempt to go to the One Star Country Club, and they tell us that we cannot because the One Star Country Club is part of the pub crawl. We sh take out. We're talking to security personnel. We take out the permit. We show them the permit, and we say One Star Country Club is not on this permit. They said, we, we see that, but there must be something else that exists that gives us the, gives them the leeway. We were told that they were part of the, of the pub crawl. Ms. Valeri, not to cut you off, yeah. but they, they have submitted to all the violations. So, I'm so, just telling you, yeah, in, you. in terms of, of, of the sequence, mm -hmm. in claiming that this is, this is brand new, we've, we've never done anything wrong, I'm telling you, we went from the Wild West, and now we have a, a law on the books, and we're trying to contain the uh, activities of the, uh, of the pub crawl promoters and the venues that are participating in them. And, uh, you know, we can get up to 17 in Federal Hill, 17 venues that are participating in, in a pub crawl at any one time. So, you know, they, they not only violated it by, by having it in their, on their website, but they allowed the One Star Country Club to participate in the, in the uh, activities themselves. They also had another, another um, establishment, the Charles, that was basically uh, included in the, in the pub crawl. But um, I'm, I'm just saying, I, I think given the, um, their, their continuing behavior and, and blatant disregard for the, for the law, that they should be given the maximum penalty in this case. Ms. Valeri, just a couple. I'm sorry, Mr. Fogelman, if you don't mind. So, I, we did read your letter. Uh, we did okay. get your letter. It's part yes. of the record, and okay. um, so so we do have that. And uh, I just want to make a couple points, um, if I could. So you had mentioned that this wasn't regulated. 
pub crawls, right? Before the permits were, were it was a different process it's in the least. It's a different process. And would you agree that now it's at least regulated and there are teeth behind? I uh, the just the, a yes or no. Would you agree? The community participation that we had discussed yes. has not occurred. And that is a problem. And I agree with you. And I, I I'm going to actually um, I'd like to bring Miss Whitmer up. Uh, to talk to her shortly, but and it, it, Ms. Abbott Cole as well. I, I don't disagree with you. The, the community issue of making sure that uh, the community is engaged before, well before, the pub crawl is, in my opinion, an absolute. And um, with no disrespect to Ms. Abbott Cole, we have tried with the DOT to get them to, and it just has not come to fruition for whatever reason. And so having said that, I would ask uh, Lindy, assuming assuming this board doesn't um, suspend you, uh, which we're permitted to do under the law, uh, I would strongly encourage that if the city, if the DOT is not coordinating with the community, Ms. Whitmer and her organization, uh, it's, a, it's a must. And uh, because this is an issue uh, well beyond the confines of the law, in my opinion, the community must be engaged, and I, I go to bat for that. But but now we have the the ability to, we have some teeth in the law that we can sanction them. Would you agree with that? Whereas yes. before we didn't. Okay. As long as as long as the law is enforced. And I just and and I, right. And you also know, Ms. Valeria, I, I'm fairly sure that the liquor board under the state statute has very little authority, all things considered in the approval of these permits, right? We've discussed that. Correct, Okay. correct. So I'd encourage, because uh, not something we could do, to if you want to revisit that, you should speak with your the state legislators uh, to revisit that, So, uh, because legislation certainly isn't perfect. And we actually appreciate and welcome that you and Mr. Valeri are out there on the streets calling these things in to Chief Inspector Fossler and the agency, because we only have eight inspectors. Maybe nine, maybe it's nine. <laughs> I stand corrected. It happens all the time, I stand corrected. So we have nine inspectors and uh, candidly, uh, they're doing a lot with very little and they have a lot more pressure on them given some of the new initiatives from the new, relatively new administration. So we want you to keep calling in 311 and being part of the, that process, we need that. Um, Mr. Fogelman. Yes, Sorry. thank you. Just briefly, um, Ms. Valeri, you recognize that the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association is the legitimate neighborhood organization of the locale where the, where the pub crawl was held. Isn't that right? There's dispute about that. How is there a dispute about the that? South Baltimore Neighborhood Association and the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association both claim. Both claim. Both claim. If, um, yeah. Mr. Valeri, if you're going to testify, you have to state your name for the record. Yeah, both. Thank you. We've had disputes be right, between the two organizations. You're not a voting member of either of those organizations, I, are you? No, I am not. Okay. However, you've attended FHNA meetings for years, yes. isn't that right? Several years. As a non-voting member. Correct. Okay. And you've been in a small minority of folks in, in that association who have generally opposed most requests by bars for to do anything. Isn't that a fact? No, not in over fact, the years. No, in fact, sir. No. Um, no. Ma'am, you spoke against the crossbar at the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association meeting even though you didn't have a vote. Isn't that right? Yes. Okay, and, and that vote was 26 to 3 in favor of, of the request by the licensee, wasn't at that, it? At that point in time. Okay, so ma'am, are you here on behalf of yourself or on behalf of this Good Neighbors Coalition? Uh, today I'm here, here as a member of the Otterbein Federal Hill area. That's mm -hmm. it. So right. My statistical area is Otterbein, but, but yesterday I was at 101 Delhi. The day before I was at Waywards. That's, that's where we socialize. That's okay. our, our right. venue. But you are a member of a group that calls himself the, the Baltimore Good Neighbors Coalition, isn't that right? Certainly, and I can give you a brochure. If okay, you'd like. and and you and your husband are two of the four listed people, humans, on the website, isn't that right? Yes. You and your husband are listed as the legislative and advocacy director, isn't that right? Yes. And the very first thing when you go to the homepage, it says Baltimore Good Neighbors Coalition, is, isn't that right? 
This is the homepage of your, of your organization? Yes. Okay, and it says you're a network of community members and neighborhood associations. Isn't that right? Yes. All right, so would it surprise you if the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association president told me that the Good Neighbors Coalition has never reached out to FHNA about the very things that you have been driving with this liquor board? They have a, wh a while back. They went to the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association. I'm not sure that Beth was the president at that time but they, they went to the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association and other neighborhood associations with a resolution. Would it surprise you that many people have never heard of your organization, including no. those who are no. very active in community associations throughout no. the city? No. Okay. Uh, just real quickly, he has, the transcript has to be clear, so one at a time, please. I'm Thank sorry, you. Bryce, sorry. Um, so uh, you say that you don't wanna be the enforcer. You said that to this board, yet your the website of the organization you're involved with uh, makes it clear that you believe there should be less liquor licenses in the city. Isn't that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So and who yes. goes, who goes, walks down their street with a pub crawl permit and demands entry into a bar? I mean, what? The person, the person who knows that the organization will simply not resist the temptation to have another bar, the One Star Country Club. I knew absolutely that One Star Country Club would be part of the, the liquor, uh, the pub crawl. I knew it. There was no, no doubt in my mind. So I, that, so I took the permit and walked down to the, so I could show the security personnel, the people who are supposedly determining who gets into a place and doesn't or don't um, that this this bar should not have been part of the venue uh, let's get back to your position with this good neighbors coalition what is your how did you were you elected to the position of legislative and advocacy director no okay how did you get that position at an organizational meeting okay and how many people were at that meeting uh, probably at the time 10 okay and are you an organization under the State Department of Assessments and Taxation? No. Yeah, I, I didn't no. see you there. Are you a, no. a campaign finance committee under no. the State Board of Elections? No. Okay. One more time. One at a time, Sorry. please. Is it true, word is on the street, that you received an endowment of $2 million from Hopkins and the Bloomberg School of Health? Is there any truth to that? I think you're, I think that's fake news, sir. Well, fake it's news. it's a rumor. And fake I just, news. have you received an endowment no, from Johns never, Hopkins? Okay, never. That, let's make that clear. All right. Um, <laughs> so why don't you, I mean, why don't you go to the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association meetings anymore? I think I, I missed the last one. Or the last right. one. We, I, I do have other, I am the president of my own con condo association. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am a volunteer for Partners for Cancer Care and Prevention, so we have other, we have charity work that we're involved in. So going to other neighborhood association meetings, I, I want to because it's useful. Uh, you get good information when you go to these meetings, and sometimes we're not able to. Now, back when I used to engage in public service, I used to have people email me and they would they would CC the entire legislative delegation, the entire city council, the mayor and city council president. Isn't it true that you have extensive email communications with the liquor board and in fact you CC all of those elected officials I just mentioned? No. No? No. So it's your testimony that, that you do not CC I'm just, I'm elected just, officials, no, not on that, on other correspondence to the liquor board. Um, I would have to review the other correspondence. Mm -hmm. Not on, certainly not on the, on the stuff that was the uh, emails that were submitted. Mm -hmm. uh, reference this but pub crawl. Mr. Fogelman, we're the relevance, please. We're getting there. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, Can you tell me, Never mind. <laughs> So, would it surprise you that, it was my experience last night at the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association board meeting, that many people had never heard of this Good Neighbor Coalition? I answered, no, I answered that. And do you think it was, in fact, will you admit that you and Mr. Valeri are the ones who drove the liquor board to write these letters to licensees encouraging mediation and putting your name and your organization in this letter? Did you have anything to do with that? 
Yes. Okay. So, and not for mediation purposes. No. No, but you admit that you're responsible for pushing the liquor board to to send out these letters with your name with Baltimore. No, that was their that's their suggestion. That was their, their suggestion. Mr. Fogelman, what letters are you? Referring sure. To? No, I'm happy to submit them into evidence. Are you are you aware of these letters? Um, I spoke with Mr. Akris and he told me about them. And just trying to understand the relevance here. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, I'll try to um, make it proper at this time. So this group, my proffer is this group has driven this violation from, from the get-go, from before the pub crawl even occurred. And what's really causing friction here, and I'm scared that the liquor board itself is lending legitimacy to an agency which quite, or to an organization which quite frankly hasn't earned it yet. I have met with Federal Hill residents who quite frankly were offended that they were in, that this Baltimore Neighbors Coalition was included with the democratically elected SBNA and FHNA, groups that have earned their legitimacy through years of advocacy. There's very little known about this Baltimore Good Neighbors Coalition other than a slick website. Madam, and, Madam Chair, if I could just, and uh, Mr. Fogelman, uh, to your, I mean, I just, my understanding of these letters, just to kind of get us back, I, I don't know, frankly, what involvement Mr. and Mrs. Valeri had or didn't have with this, but I know from the commission standpoint, we've had a number of issues and we have pushed, as you know, legislation to try and get groups to mediate before, to try and work out issues, because mm -hmm. sometimes our issue, our decision-making authority is, is, um, is challenging. Um, so, I'm not sure where you're going with this. Well, let me, let me just make two points. I mean, I'd be happy to quickly, and then I'll move, happily move on. Um, and uh, Ms. Whitmer probably should have a word in this yes. since I've invoked her or name many times. So I'm sorry about that. Two quick points on this letter. This letter, uh, which has gone out to many licensees, this particular letter went out to a Federal Hill licensee. It says that you are in receipt of this letter due, the, due to the number of concerns that have been raised by the community, okay? And... Would it surprise you that F8, neither FHNA nor SBNA have made any complaints to the liquor board about that particular establishment? So then the question, and then the second point is, by saying we would like you to mediate with FHNA, SBNA, and this Good Neighbors Coalition can be seen as a slap in the face to many who belong to and volunteer to those those legitimate organizations and they don't believe that this good neighbors coalition of four people should citywide should should have that kind of legitimacy and they're worried that the liquor board thinks that they speak for the city I, I understood i understand your argument let's move on you got it that. sorry thank you thank you all right um would you it's your client Yes, yes he's, he's quick. It's just real quick. Number one, we, we've never done a call ever without the proper approval with permitting per process, which Michelle can attest to, and actually Liquor Authority can attest to, too. We've never done a call, so we didn't do Halloween without that. Number one. Number two, our uh, numbers was never 400. We've always had the numbers on uh, the permit that were accurate. And number three is that I'd be more than happy to talk with you afterwards, mm -hmm. even though you know what's going on and still try to make work with you guys to make things going better moving forward. That's just my Thank opinion. you. Thank you. And um, uh, Ms. Abbott Cole did show me the permit while um, they were testifying about 400 people. The permit for this event says 4,000 people. No, and no, no. I, I think her testimony was related to before the... We got, uh, we got some control. Be, yes. Fair enough. Be before um, the, yeah. The, yeah. the bill was enacted. Exactly. Thank you. No further questions. Mr. Valeri, did you have a comment, a brief yes, comment? Yes, I'd like to respond mm -hmm. to some errors that were made here. Very quick. Uh, if, is it different than what your wife has already testified uh, to? No. No? Uh, we are, yes, it is. It is. We are Very not quick. an offshoot or a uh, splinter group from FHNA, from their Liquor Advisory Committee. Uh, we are a valid, we are new. Here's who we are. Thank you. We work citywide. 
You'll be hearing from us shortly on the Waverly Woods situation and the Wa Waverly, yeah. Waverly Tower. Uh, that, that's what I wanted to add to what Barbara said. Mr. Valeri, anything related to this issue that we're talking about today? Yeah, well, if uh, the comment that we're just an offshoot and we're new and we have no status is valid, so is my response. Thank you. Thank you. And why don't we call up a representative from FHNA, uh, Ms. Beth Whitmer, please. Please state your name. Uh, did you actually, first of all, did you um, get sworn in? No, I did not. Sworn. I wasn't planning to. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Spelling of your last name? W-H-I-T-M-E-R. Thank you. Please state where you're from. Um, I am president of the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association. And I live in Federal Hill. Thank you. What would you like to add? Um, just very briefly, I know a lot of things are being said here, um, and I, you know, obviously there's a lot of emotion behind it. Um, the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association um, has. I would say transformed over the past couple of years. We are, as a neighborhood, are very concerned about businesses in our uh, neighborhood and in Baltimore in general, um, and are really actively working with the businesses, both the retail businesses, bars and restaurants, to make things better. We believe um, probably more than ever that a community association is not just residents, it's residents, it's schools, it's churches, and it's the businesses. So we're partnering with Federal Hill Main Street and um, the Business Association and all working together. Um, I, I think my concern is that some of the things that are being mentioned here today, for example, the Lindy Promotions event and the, the letter that you um, are referen that Steve was f referencing have not been brought to the attention of our board or membership. Um, that's very concerning to me. If there's, um, and, and I have learned a little more after finding about it, out about it secondhand, um, I do not think that we, particularly in, as regards to the restaurants, uh, bars that these letters these letters are referring to I think that um, the we we don't feel that we we are in support of our businesses we want them to follow the law make no mistake we want the laws and the rules to be followed however we don't think that shutting down a business or imposing um, ridiculously high uh, fines necessarily fits the crime so uh, I guess that's my point, is, is that um, we think there's been a lot of improvement over the last four years. I've only lived here in four years, to be quite candid, but I have been involved with the association as a board member for four years. And I think that there's been a lot of improvement over the last few years. A lot of it's because of, of the activities of the former Liquor Advisory Committee. I wanna give them their due. However, it's, in our view, it's time to move on and broaden our scope, and that's what we're trying to do. It's kind of that simple. Thank you. May I make one more well, Ms. Whitmer, so you met with Lindy Promotions, I understand. Um, who from the, your, your organization will be their point of contact going forward? Um, and it, it will be myself and Faith Millspa, who just had to leave. She is a board member also, a newly elected board member, uh, very active in the community, and we are the co-chairs of this business relations committee. So we are, we are the points of contact. Okay, great, thank you. Ms. Valeri, do you have a question? I'm, we are, we're in total agreement with, with Beth and the objectives that this business committee, strategy committee has uh, to improve the neighborhood, uh, improve the businesses, improve the restaurants and, and bars. But I think it puts a, a, a greater onus on the bars and restaurants who have liquor licenses, um, as well as the as the businesses, to obey the law. They have to help us to help them. And um, you know, again, we don't want to be enforcers. We want them to be self-regulated, self-enforcing in terms of adherence to the law. So we never have to come to another liquor board meeting again. And that's my my bottom line. Mr. Fulgamer and Ms. Whitmore, anything else? No, I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Conclusion? 
Oh, yes. Thank yeah. you. Um, despite the, t other than the testimony of the Valeris, all the other evidence here from Miss Abbott Cole and everything else suggests that, in fact, Lindy has always been a law abider. They have, per they, in fact, Miss Abbott Cole has testified. They've been in compliance with all the laws and all the other events that they've had. They're the big daddy of the pub crawl companies. They, they're the big one. They almost they pioneered pub crawls in some cities. Um, they have the longest track record of anybody that will ever come before your board to ask for a permit for one of these. They have been, other than our little diversion and to me wanting to understand more about this good neighbors coalition, that, that's on me. My client, uh, Mr. Gable, has been nothing but contrite, uh, understands the need to be in compliance with all laws. He has put himself on a probation, as I say, for six months in this city at the request of Liquor Board administrative staff until we sort this mess out. And so I would ask that you consider, given their track record, that uh, they be responsible for a fine and that you let this company continue to put on these events. Obviously, if, if they are banned for any amount of time, they will, the, the events won't go away. Okay, somebody else will step in and do events. Will they have more experience than Lindy? No. So you can't make the problem go away by suspending this company, is what I'm saying. The, the, bar, the pub crawls will fill in, but then you'll have groups that may not have the track record that they do. And so I'd ask you to consider that and ask you to consider it again that this is a relatively new process and this indeed is the first hearing for such a violation. And I thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, after having reviewed um, article beverage article, alcohol beverage article 12-1101.1 and um, uh, section 12-2802, which, which uh, discusses the penalty that it, the board can impose and uh, based on subsection C1, the board shall impose a fine of no less than $1,000. So as to um, violation of alcohol beverage article 12-1101.1, um, D to little, uh, three little I to March 9, 2018, I impose a um, a $1,000 fine. May I? Uh, and I'm sorry I didn't do it earlier, but I, I really b believe that these charges need to be merged for sentencing, at least the illegal conducts. Um, yeah, I, mean, I don't think the law, I don't think the intent of the law is for you to charge a fine as to all six of these when it's the, when it's the similar conduct. Mr. Fogelman, uh, you didn't raise that issue before. No, I didn't. We, no, I did not. The, I did not. When we found the violation mm -hmm. as to the six mm -hmm. charges. So it, it's denied at this point. Thank you. Uh, as to the second violation, 12 1101.1e, um, $1,000 fine. As to violation of Rule 4.16, illegal conduct on March 9, 2018, I will impose a $100 fine. As to violation of Rule 3.12, general welfare on March 10, 2018, I will impose a $100 fine. As to the violation on um, of Article Beverage Article, Alcohol Beverage Article 12-1101.1D to three little I three on March 10, 2010, um, $1,000 fine. And as to the violation of rule 4.16 illegal conduct, a hundred dollar fine. The total there is. Yeah, so, so Madam Chair, I think we have to look at the numbers again. I think we, um, even with the statute, we can't, we can't find more than $3,000. As to the, I took it as each one. As each one, is that your understanding, Mr. Yes. Rackers? There, yes. There are two tracks. The um, tracks under 12-101 or 1101, and then the rules and regulations. 
So I think there's a total of three thousand three hundred dollars in fines, as, as, as per Madam Chair. Is that correct? Yes. That's my finding. Could you repeat those fines again? What the last? Um, Okay, that's what it was. Okay. Um, I concur with the chair. Based on uh, what we have to work with, uh, it's clear that each fine for uh, on the, uh, Article uh, 12 dash, I think that's what, 2802. It states that we can find on less than $1,000 and no more than $3,000. And or we can add a suspension to that. So uh, I concur based on what was said by Madam Chair. So Commissioner Jones is right that 12-2802 uh, C2 authorizes uh, the board to um, uh, essentially suspend the license for at least one year. Uh, that is not something I, I'm comfortable to do, doing. Um, and it sounds like uh, my colleagues would be in agreement with that, although it should be no surprise that if you come back, which we don't want to, uh, that that could very well be on the table. Uh, I, I read 122802 a little bit, li little bit differently um, and uh, so um, I will, um, uh, for, vi for uh, the violation of art uh, alcohol beverage article 12-101.1D2, three little I's, two, um, I would find uh, $750 for violation of alcohol beverage 12-1101.1E, I would find $750. I concur with my colleagues on the violation of Rule 4.16, illegal conduct, and would agree with $100. Would agree with $100 as well for Rule 3.12, general welfare, on March 10th. Um, and with respect to uh, our alcoholic beverages 12-1101.1D2, three small I's, three on March 10th, I would do $750. Better to make sure my math is right. And then. Um, For uh, uh, Rule 4.16, legal conduct, I would also uh, find a fine of $100. Well, based on what the commission is saying, uh, I feel a little bad about these fines also. This don't seem to be right with the law. It's the law. Absolutely. I'm going to change my vote and go along with uh, Commissioner to my far left. But, I mean, so I, I just for the record, these are uh, s six separate counts, which is the basis for my finding as to the thousand dollars per count under this uh, article. So I don't uh, what I don't know what the ultimate ruling. What was the exact, Mr. Akris? You have. Two thousand uh, five hundred and fifty is what I have under your finding, and I'm understanding is that uh, jointly found by Commissioner Jones. I thought we had at least three thousand. We got no, not from my findings. Okay. This is where it gets interesting. Where we don't know how we're all going to roll, <laughs> so we're <laughs> talking about it on. This is why Larry comes because. Repeat your findings again so we can know the numbers. Uh, so in the first one, I, I found 750, second, 750, third, $100, fourth, $100. Third, 100, fourth, 100. Um, and then the uh, fifth one is 750 as well. And six. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Do I have that right? No. No, 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 I'm sorry. Let me start over. First violation of the alcoholic beverage article on March 9th, 750. Second violation of the alcoholic beverage article on March 9th, 750. The violation of Rule 4.16, 
$100, the violation of Rule 3.12, $100, the violation of the alcoholic beverage, Article 750, and finally, the violation of Rule 4.16 on March 10th, $100. $2,550. Thirty days to pay. Yes. All right. Thank you very much for your extra time in this unusual case. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, we agree. I agree. It's two against one. The two one. Got it. Ready for the exhibits? All right. I'd like to call exhibits for the record. Board Exhibit 1, Pub Tour License. Board Exhibit 2, Cease and Desist Letter, dated 2-14-2018. Board Exhibit 3, Email from um, Inspector Joanne Martin, dated March 5th, 2018. Board Exhibit 4, Email from Michelle Abbott Cole, dated March 6th, 2018. Board Exhibit 5, Email from HMB Valeri, dated March 10th, 2018. Board Exhibit 6, Email from Rosalind Case, dated March 10th, 2018. Board Exhibit 7, Investigation Report from Chief Inspector Mark Fossler. Board Exhibit 8, Investigation Report from Agent Chris Amalis. Board Exhibit 9, Email from Douglas Page, dated uh, May 21st, 2018. Licensee Exhibit 1, Former City Liquor Board Letter, dated 6-11-2018. Community Exhibit 1, Baltimore Good Neighbor Coalition Brochure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that conclude, th does that conclude our Session. That concludes our afternoon docket. Yes, Thank Madam you. Chair. Next time the board will be in session will be June 21st, 2018 at 5 p.m. It's our night docket.